What's up, strength coaches? Welcome to this masterclass from Buddy Morris, Adam Meekins, and Eric Cressy. Our first person that you're going to hear from is Buddy Morris. Buddy Morris has been working in football for over 30 years. A majority of his time has been in the NFL. Prior to the NFL, he was working in college football. Buddy has worked with some all-pro, all-American athletes, and his outtakes and his thoughts on strength and periodization is something that is completely refreshing for coaches to hear because it is not dogmatic. You're going to love this conversation with Buddy. Enjoy. Uh, first of all, I, I'm truly honored that you gave me this opportunity to spend an hour with you. Uh, I really appreciate it. It means a great deal to me, especially at, you know, at my age. I'm now 66. I'm nearing the end of uh, what's been a life pursuit and journey um, forever and ever. But I started this profession in 1980 was very lucky. I actually fell into the profession. I will always be internally uh, grateful and indebted to Jackie Sherrill, who I still stay in touch with, Pitts, uh, former head coach of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I was running track for University of Pittsburgh. Believe it or not, I was a short sprinter. At one time, I was very fast. People don't believe that. <laughs> but I, yes, I was very fast. Uh, 60 meter started, or the 100? Which one? Uh, 100 meters. 100 meters. <laughs> Believe it or not, I ran slightly under uh, 10, 500 meters one Don't time. You did. One time. So people say, how many times? And it's just one time, just like you're saying, Boulders only run that time. One time. Um, but I was pretty consistent. Um, and hamstrings ruined my career, to be honest with you. Uh, so being running track for Pitt, my last year, I decided to forego my scholarship and just uh, really wanted to get more and more into strength training. Uh, fell into strength training because of a guy named Harvey Glantz, who I actually met out here through a good friend of mine, uh, Olympic gold medalist Roger Kingdom. And Harvey Glantz is really, really is really the reason I started lifting in college. I had heard that there was a sprint at Auburn, a good bench 350 pounds. In my mind, I just put two and two together, and I thought, well, oh, if I get stronger, I'll get faster. And, and that was true. And But as I've aged, that becomes true to a certain point. But anyway, I started working with with some of the players from the pit football team in preparation for the NFL draft. Back in the old days, they didn't have a combine, Justin. They would just call an athlete and say, hey, we're going to be there tomorrow. So you could get three, three calls in a row. Three days in a row have to work out for different, different teams. And I was good friends with Bob Jury, who played and was a starting safety for University of Pittsburgh. I went to high school with him. I mean, we went to high school together. Uh, eventually went up to pit together, and he and I were very close. And I started working with him on his 40 time. Lo and behold, Jackie Sherrill found out about it. I started working with Gussie Sinceri, whose brother Sal played for the University of Pittsburgh. I started helping Gussie with his 40. Uh, players started going on telling Jackie Sherrill about it. I get a call two weeks after graduation. And I mean, I'm ready to go to work for the old European health spa. If you don't remember those, it's a, if you've ever seen uh, Van Halen's album, Best of Both Worlds, the guy holding the big world on his back that was the emblem for european health spas oh yeah yeah so i'm getting ready to go to work for european health spas get a call from kip smith who was a trans university of pittsburgh said jackie wants to talk to you so i go in and i sit down and i was very intimidated by coach Sherl. very intimidated <clears throat> but i remember he says think you can do the job and it didn't dawn on me what he was asking me i thought i was going to be a ga so he throws the keys across to me and says job's yours i'm like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> but here's the kicker he did it without permission from the university this is the last week of april first week of may justin and fiscal budgets aren't aligned till july so jackie just mm. said sure. so coach short was literally paying me out of his own pocket to take a street car and a bus and i didn't have a car um my parents we, i grew up poor my parents were divorced we had my mother my mother uh who is my idol, is 90 years old now, raised five boys by herself on a bank teller salary and welfare back in the day or public assistance. So <clears throat> we didn't have, I didn't have a car and he would pay for my streetcar and bus every day, give me money out of his pocket until I eventually got um, approved by administration who Kaz Mosinski was the athletic director at the time at the University of Pittsburgh who, by the way, is a very close friend of mine, Tom Mazinski's late uncle, literally gave the okay to hire me. I didn't get my first paycheck from Pitt until the end of August. And I was getting married September of that year, my first marriage. So, yeah, it was, it was, um, 
it was very eye-opening. So I started. I stayed there for ten years. I left in 1989. Uh, when my daughter Kara was diagnosed with autoimmune liver disease, I went to work for a hospital in a small town northwest of about an hour and a half northwest of Pittsburgh, Sharon, PA, Hermitage, PA. Worked there for seven years, which is where I became. Really, started going to the medical library and reading medical books, and I stopped reading on how to get stronger. To be honest with you. I just started reading about the body systems and how they're, we are an inter, interdependent matrix system and no system works independently of the other systems. And I did that because of my daughter's liver disease, trying to figure out ways to help her. I got a call in 97, uh, was asked to go back to University of Pittsburgh, went back to University of Pittsburgh in 2005. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 2001, 2001, got a call from the Cleveland Browns. Understand this, Justin, I never had any desire to work in the NFL. <laughs> it wasn't my life's pursuit. It wasn't my goal. I wasn't going to commit suicide if I didn't get there. It wasn't all I lived for or dreamed about. I had no aspirations to get here. Uh, it happened. I took the, the, the chance, uh, stayed there for three years, was unemployed for a year. I uh, got a call from University of Buffalo, went to University of Buffalo for literally six months under Turner Gill, who I think the world of. <clears throat> um, met my second wife there. Uh, I always tell people I took the best thing that you know, the city of Buffalo had to offer and got it the hell out. So I, I, I moved back to Pittsburgh again. Um, I'm there and I, and I get a chance to go to the Washington Redskins with Mike Shanahan. I turned that down because my youngest daughter was now in Pitts Nursing School, which means tuition waiver. Mm. We get a new athletic director. I walk into Coach Wanstead's office. I said, Coach, I got to tell you, we're all in trouble with this athletic director because I worked for the guy before. He's an egotistical maniac. Everything revolves around him. Uh, um, Dave, Dave Wanstead told me, he goes, don't worry about it. I got the chancellor in my pocket. One year later, we're all fired. <laughs> now, thankfully, I had signed a three-year extension. So for two years, Justin, I literally sat around unemployed, couldn't find a job. Nobody would hire me for oh, two, wow. two years, for really three years. Um, the second of the two years, I'm, I'm sorry, two years, uh, my wife decides her and her son want to open up a performance center of all places, Buffalo, New York, where she's from. I'm telling her, ain't going to work, ain't going to work. Oh, it'll work. I'm like, ain't going to work, it'll work. And this goes on. So, all right, I give in. So we go there for one year. Uh, and I get a call from BA, and that's how I wind up here. So I've been at the University of Pittsburgh three different times from 97 to 2001. Went to the University of Buffalo, got called to come back to Pitt again with Coach Wanstead, stayed there till James, which is where I, I brought in James Smith, who I think the world of. He's one of the most intelligent people I've ever been around in my entire life. What really amazed me about James one day is he walks in the office with an uh, acoustic guitar and starts strumming out Stairway to Heaven. I'm like, where the fuck did you learn to do that? And then I find out his degree in college was classical music. I'm like, now I know why you're so smart. You're a musician. And musicians are incredibly talented and incredibly smart people. I don't care what anybody says. And I um, worked with James, and that's why I met Mike Cadango, uh, Alan DeGenero. There's some of the conversations we would have in my office were just incredible with myself, Alan, Anthony Paroli, who's now the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Micah Dangle, and James Smith. It was just two hours of some of the most thought-provoking conversations you'd ever want to be involved with. I tell people today, the true definition of intelligence is not what you know, it's what you do when you don't know. Mm. My desk looks like it does. And I'll be the first to tell you, Justin, I don't know everything. I'm, le I'm learning every day. I just went to Matt Jordan's force plate course. Uh, he came to Phoenix, and I'm, call, I'm constantly bothering, thank God for Matt Jordan, because I'm constantly bothering him, to be honest with you. Uh, but then I, I went back to Pitt, and then I'm back to Buffalo, and then back to Pittsburgh again, and back to Buffalo for six weeks. I'm driving home, and I'm not a fanatic, I'm not a cold weather fan, don't like it. Have Pittsburgh to must not have been for you or Buffalo. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm proud to be a Pittsburgher, but I tell my, my wife, I don't want to go back there either. So <clears throat> I'm sitting outside the University of Buffalo's weight room, you know, 
and it's, I'm, I'm freezing my balls off. It's so cold. And the night before, I got a thing on my phone that said, BA cold. So I text BA, I said, did you butt down me? He goes, no, I need to talk to you in the morning. I tell my wife, I said, don't get excited. Just do not get excited. He's probably calling me on Caleb, um, Caleb Mack, Khalil Mack, who plays for the University of Buffalo. I don't know anything about him. I'm just going to tell BA, don't know anything about him. Can't help you. So sure enough, next day he calls me. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm freezing my fucking balls off. What are you doing? And he goes, I need you on a plane Wednesday, tomorrow. I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yes, because he had told me when he first got the job if he was in, I'm in. But then he got here and called me the next day and said, this is the hardest phone call I've ever had to make. I'm sorry, I can't bring you in. So he told me to sit here. I told my wife that. Um, so he opened up the performance center in Buffalo, and I hate to backtrack. But then I get the phone call, and that's how I wound up here. That's exactly how I went. I've known B.A. since my days with the Cleveland Browns. He went to the Steelers. I went back to Pitt. I would talk to him and see him every day. Um, and that's how, that's how I'm here. How I've been here for 10 years and through four different staffs now, I can't tell you. Yet, by the grace of God, I'm lucky. Uh, but like I said, it was never my aspiration. It's never my goal to be in the NFL. All I was ever wanted to do, to be honest with you, Justin, was be the head strength coach for the University of Pittsburgh. And that happened, I was blessed that it happened three times. Actually, four years ago, they called me and asked me to come back for the fourth time. And as much as I love Pittsburgh, as much as I love Pitt, I just, uh, once you've been in the sun, and you see the sun every day, and listen, they can say what they want about the heat. I don't give a shit. I don't have to shovel heat. I can put up with the heat. That's the of the year. We keep it so cold in our building that sometimes I'll be outside sitting on the wall in the sun because it gets too cold in here. So I'm a creature of warmth and habit, and I hope to one day retire here. I have another year left on my contract. We'll see what happens after this year because you're not guaranteed anything in this league. <clears throat> they say the NFL stands for not for long, right? Honestly, NFL stands for no fucking logic. Ooh. That's the way I see it. Because the way things are set up, and we might as well get into this right now. Here's four words we need to eliminate from the English language. As, as the language or conversations as strength or physical preparation coaches are concerned. Get rid of injury prevention because you ain't preventing injury. Thank you. You don't want to get injured. Keep going. Don't be a fucking athlete or don't ever get <laughs> off the bench. Because the more you get exposed to the competitive environment, the higher the likelihood of injury occurring. J.J. Watt, last year I did his shoulder rehab. Four weeks after surgery, he comes to me, he says, you're doing my rehab, Brett Fisher's doing my tissue work, Chad's doing my running. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you're doing everything now. I'm like, no, no, no. He goes, no, you're fucking doing everything. Here's a guy who spent 12 years, and I have the utmost respect for him. Guys like him, Carson Palmer, Zachers, Buddha Baker is my hero. Mm, love Buddha. He's awesome. Uh, he just everything you want in a player and as a person. Same thing with JJ. So JJ's played in the league for 12 years and 19 surgeries. I've never seen anybody prepare harder in my life. And this is 43 years, Justin, and JJ Watt. How do you explain 12 surgeries? So get rid of the words injury prevention because you're not going to prevent shit, especially the way the NFL is set up. And what people, oh, the normal yeah. fan, doesn't understand, Justin. No, no. The minute the season ends, you can't touch him yep. till um, voluntary offseason. And, and then they're gone for a big gap, yeah. They're, mm. they're, and here's the problem with that. First of all, abruptly ending anything causes great stress and harm to the human body. It's like slamming into a wall in your car going 100 miles an hour and slamming into a brick wall. Because that's what you do. The body expects to play, then all of a sudden you abruptly stop it. And you do nothing. Mm. There has to be, and I, I've done it here for a couple years, and I, I told Tommy Maslinski I was doing, he goes, great idea, they'll never do it. And he's right. A transition period into active rest. If you're an elite athlete, you should never stop training. It's your job. Your body is your corporation. Stop treating your profession as a part-time job. You don't need time off. What I'm saying is now, take a week off, I get it. But now just pick the lowest hanging fruit. Charlie Francis's bike tempo fits in perfect to a transition period of just active recovery and low intensive work. Low intensive work. Before, I didn't say go back in the weight room and start hanging and bagging four days a week. I didn't say that. I said pick the lowest hanging fruit, 
do some mobility work, do some band work, some body weight exercise. You know, tell me you can't do a fucking push up. I mean, fuck, you could go swim. That'd be great. Yeah, swimming, exactly. Do something. But this, this sitting on my ass doing nothing <laughs> is the worst thing you can do. Because two things happen. Number one, you dive deeper down the rabbit hole of recovery. Mm. We want to recover? Sure we do. But you'll recover faster, more efficiently, and better by being active. Motion is the lotion. You'll heal faster by movement instead of laying on your ass and getting rubbed and tugged on on a, on a, on a table by some therapist. Second of all, time away from the, di- the gym leads to a lower adaptive response of attended loading capacity. So now you go back to training like you did. I'm going to go back to four days a week. I'm going to get specific. You're not to, you skip over general qualities, but general quality supports support specific qualities. And you got to remember this. Your fitness level is directly proportional to or related to the amount of time it took you to acquire it. Charlie mm-hmm. Francis told me a long time ago, Justin, the mm-hmm. rush to put things in place leads uncertainty down the road. Mm-hmm. I added dot, dot, dot. Usually that's disastrous. So anything gained fast is lost fast. So <clears throat> just maintaining some semblance of movement, body weight exercise, low aerobic work on a bike. Quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out and it helps you be notified when we have new content get released. So again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy this content. And with that, let's get back to the show. Well, you'll feel 100% better. And then you go back to training. Just I'm going back to four days a week. I'm starting doing my DV drills. You, got, you tell me you forgot how to backpedal in three months. Right. That's not, you don't need <laughs> After to get, doing it for 13, 14 yeah. years. Why are you getting so specific so soon? Do the general qualities and then move into specific work. And you got to remember this too. The more they master the specific abilities on the field, the greater general strength is going to transfer anyway. So general. Why do you need to start getting so specific right away? Because all that's going to do is lead you open to reactive tendinopathy. Because if you think about it, all right, nervous system adapts first. Nerves move muscles, so muscles next. Muscle moves bone, then bones next. What attaches bone to muscle is a tendon. What attaches bone to bone is ligaments, so tendons, ligaments are next. And then last but not least, it's a fascia system. I used to have one guy, I'm not going to say his name, he's no longer with us, great player. Um, that's with another team now, but I'd have to text him four weeks into this off season saying, why are you doing repeat vertical jumps on a Vertimax already? You're not ready for that. Your tendons aren't ready for that load. You can't do that. But this is what their personal terrorists do. When they hire That's the, I forgot about that name. It's so far from removed from what we're trying to do because, and I get it, I get yeah. it. I, I was in the private industry for a while. You're trying to sell a business. You're trying to sell your system. You're trying to promote your brand so you can make money. I, I get that. But get this. When the shit hits the fan, they're not going to point the finger at you. They're going to point the, point the finger at the training and strength staff. But all I'm going to do is turn around and say, well, you know what? I haven't seen him since January. I don't know what he's been doing. I don't know when he started. We sent home programs, but I can tell you right now, because I can look on my email, none of these programs have been accessed. So... What about their personal terrorists? Because the longest point of time we get to train them is when they're the most beat up. In when season, yeah. activity takes precedent. Things that are like in nature compete for the same CNS resources. The stress of the game, you can't train them heavy in season. These guys, these guys are 22 to, what was Tom Brady, 45? Yeah. When he retired? You get a wide range of age. And none you get a wide range of age, as they get older, the greater their injury history becomes. So here's what I tell people. Every one of us, Justin, <clears throat> is like a tire. Some of us are Michelin Pirelli high performance. Some of us are bargain basement baby O's. What's the common denominator amongst all tires? They have a tread. They go on a car. Oh, they have tread. They have the life of the tread depends on here. My tire's properly inflated, balanced, aligned, do I align my car? What's the external environment I drive in? Am I a hard breaker or hard decelerator? How do I drive my car? How do I, who t- whose responsibility is that? That's yours. Your mechanic tells you all that. Preparation coaches, we're mechanics. We tell you all that. It's your job to do it. Especially now with the amount of time these guys have off, 90% of preparation is your responsibility, not mine. But if it's not in place, I get blamed. But the, 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 long, the, the, the moral to the story is everybody's tread wears out. 
no matter what you do, your tread is going to wear out on your tire. I'm 66 years old. My tread is worn out. I'm on the inner tube of the bicycle tire. That's what I got left. I want to buy Bullshit. One. Bullshit. Look at you. You still oh. you're still Michelin. You're a Michelin man right there. Cut it cut it out right now. Once that fucking inner tube goes, I'm done. Uh -huh. I tell, I tell my wife Bullshit. You can plug it, you can pump it back up. I'm not buying. I'm like, this is just damage controls. Why I go to the gym now, not because I want to, it's because of discipline. I don't go to the gym because I want to. I go to the gym because it's what I do. It's where I relieve my stress. It's where I still enjoy going. And don't get me wrong, I'm more machine-based now because I have this thing called psoriatic arthritis. That I thought, you know, when you're a kid, arthritis, how bad can that be? Fuck, it's real bad. <laughs> my shoulders don't go above my head. I can't put a bar on my back anymore. So I just do all machine work. And so people who dish on machines, your day's coming. Smith, I live on a Smith machine. I think Smith machine is great. See, you got a, that's a bar on your back. What the fuck are you talking about? I can't put it on the back. I just incline off of it. Ah, uh, okay. And you have weight limits you set, and you have a time limit. So when I go to the gym, I'm like, one hour. If I ain't got it done in an hour, I'm not going to get it done in two hours. Because all I'm going to do is further deplete myself, make myself more miserable and more tired. So I give myself one hour. When I get done, I get done. So my wife will tell you, Monica will tell you, no, you're always calling me telling me you got one more set. And that does happen. You got one more set, one more set. But anyway, these athletes got to understand, your body's your corporation. Mm. You're the CEO of it. You're the human resources. You hire and fire who you need to take care of your body. But the hardest thing we teach rookies is, this ain't college no more. There's no structure. You're your structure. You gotta be on time. You have to be in a building at a certain time. You gotta practice at a high level. You're not on a four year deal anymore. This ain't a four year scholarship. But every year, excuse me, every year they're gonna draft people to take your job. So you better be a pro about it and you better take care of your body. You better have massages set up twice a week, all year round. In the off season, too many guys want to spend too much time laying on a table. You don't need to lay on a table. Inflammation, hormonal disruptions, which is why we train for a hormonal response. Metabolical stress, enzymatic changes are all part of the adaptation phase. Let the body do its job. If you start to blunt that, mm -hmm. I gotta get ice tub, I gotta get edel today, I gotta get cupped. When it comes time to use those, you blunted their effectiveness because you see them all year round. Now, I didn't say anything about a massage. I think massage is great once or twice a week. It allows you to handle 20% more intensity, 40% more volume, as Charlie told me a long time ago. So yeah, I'm all for that. But these other modalities and this, the search for secret stuff is getting outrageous anymore. Here's the three things you need to pay attention to, just real quick. The no, you're good, keep going. Hydration, nutrition, and here's a shocker, sleep. Sleep. There's your best recovery mod modalities right there. But we are such a gimmick-oriented society. Fuck, yeah. Winston, I always tell, every, every podcast I do, I always say this, Winston Churchill got it right. Americans will always get it right after they've tried everything else. <laughs> what we do. That's what the fuck we do as a society. Because we're always looking for that top secret, never seen before, double mm. probation, secret exercise, workout program. Here's what works, the program you're on. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not working at it. The best program in the world is always the one you're not on. Amen. Yeah. And yeah. then you get on it, Justin, and what happens? You're going to hit a wall. Because in our world, it's called law of accommodation everything is gonna lose its effectiveness over time. I don't believe in periodization. Periodization is a concept. It's an idea. It's a plan. How many times do you know a plan to go according to, how many times do you know things go according to plan? I mean, yeah, never. You have your plan, then you, you work, have a plan, work your plan, but don't be a slave to your plan, right? Exactly. I, I don't have Kyler's sheet with me, damn it. I had Kyler Murray's sheet. And I have, a, it, it looks like this. And then when I'm done with it, it's red marked everywhere. Yeah, the number, yeah. I mean, fuck, it's if changed. anybody just has it the exact same, like you're not really coaching, you're not analytically thinking, you're not no. actually talking with the kid, because at the end of the day, whatever you're trying to do, if you had programmed dumbbell bench for him and something was changed, you're like, all right, fuck, what can I do for a horizontal pressing, right? And it's exactly. it doesn't matter. Like 
here's what people don't understand. We're not going to compete in those lifts when we play a game. We are no. still, we're sportsmen. We're sportsmen. Yes. A squat is a squat. A squat is a movement pattern. That's all it is. Yeah. Back squat is no different than a goblet squat to me. No different than a front squat. No different than a zercher squat. It's just different place. The, the load is going to be different. Belt squat, different. It's still a squatting movement. I think a trap bar pull is better than a squat any day, to yeah. be honest with you. I think as long as it strengthens the extensors of the arms in a scapular plane, who cares what you do? Bench press, dumbbell bench, loaded push-ups, cable pressing, who cares? It's still strengthening the arms in a scapular plane. Who says you have to bench press? Older guys, as they get older, I found it's better to use them dumbbells with them, especially during the season. Because if the work, listen, if the work hasn't been done by the time you get here, you're shit out of luck. Because <laughs> now you only have a finite supply of energy. So during the season, the more advanced these guys get, the greater their outputs. The greater the outputs, greater the cost of the output. I have to ask myself this question, and all preparation coaches have to ask yourself this question. Do I want my outputs to be specific or do I want to be general? general? Depends on the time of the year, but yeah, yeah, like, right? You mean the time of the year. Once they get on the field, that takes precedent. You only have so much energy. That's what the human body is designed for. The body is designed for, to adapt so it can survive, but it survives by regulating its energy. So if I'm going to continue to deplete myself, there's a cost to pay for everything we do. Everything. If I'm writing an uh, acceleration program, and it's heavily based acceleration, max velocity, and it's for my skill guys, because I believe in training skill guys like Olympic sprinters, mm -hmm. and you have to make adjustments in the weight room. Because there's nothing that we'll ever do in this weight room. It's going to mimic the forces produced in max velocity work. And to me, Maximal strength is a poor indicator of the special strength capabilities of the motor system or the nervous system. 100%. There's nothing we will ever do in a weight room, Justin, you know this, that's going to mimic the forces incurred when these guys go into sprint work or acceleration work. Nothing. We can give them things that help them Correct. through dynamic correspondence. The other two words I think we've got to get rid of is sport-specific. Mm. I mean, sport-specific... Like Charlie Francis told me a long time ago, play the sport all year round. There's your, spe there's your specificity. These guys who invent these exercises in the weight room, you've got to be fucking kidding me. They're circus acts. Not what you uh, do field. Now, from uh, a vector standpoint, from an amplitude, from a force standpoint, it may mimic it, which is what we talk about in dynamic correspondence. That's a, that's a difference. But to say we're going to train sports specific in a weight room, <laughs> no, you're not. You're not. I'm just going to tell you that right now. No, you're not. From a bioenergetic standpoint, you can do specific on the field, and that's the development of the energy system. So developing power before capacity. Yeah, that's that's where you're going to do it. But I still see people who are still running 300 yard shuttles, 110s, crosses. I'm like, why? Just tell me why. I, I don't understand that our game is a game of five second bursts of maximum work it's not endurance endurance work is the ability to sustain a low level activity for a prolonged period of time it is an intermittent or capacity sport the ability to re repeat high intense efforts over an extended period of time with if you think about it they're all getting and I've timed it on the field even up tempo offenses are still getting 18 to 20 seconds rest now I want to ask you about linemen. What do you think about them? Because we had this conversation in that group chat I was talking with you about. Linemen, little offensive linemen, not defense. They're a little bit more of just like, if you think about it, they might go to the line of scrimmage, block somebody, fall down, get back up, go to the huddle. Like, they might be a little bit more, like, because that was me in my life. Like, I, I was offensive lineman, so it's like, nah, that's pretty fucking tiring, like, to do all that shit and then go to the huddle and go back. Like, that might be a little bit more closer to lactate, but I agree with you that you still don't need to be doing 300s and 110s. No, but. no. And again, if you have a well-developed aerobic system, mm -hmm. your ability to starve off lactate is going to be in place. In James Smith's book... Uh, Which one, the football one or just the regular one? The football one. Yep. Uh, uh, it's on my desk. I'm not even going to reach for it because it's under a pile of papers. And in James, book, James Smith's book, it talks about the development of the aerobic system must mimic 
or stimulate the muscles that occurs in a competitive environment or exercise because um, your anaerobic threshold is a direct reflection of the oxidative capacity of the, of the tissue involved in the work. So that tells me my tempo work, which is aerobic in nature, mm -hmm. doesn't have to, it's 70% or less, it's not 75%, it's not 80%, intensive, intensive tempo work gets that high and borderlines on glycolytic work. And that should be done first. But when you move into regular tempo work as you get closer to the season, and we, we just, here with me, what I'll do is, beginning of the year, my tempo work is 35 second rest intervals. As I get into capacity work, a-lactic capacity, my tempo work volume, I mean my rest intervals go to 45 second. My tempo work always peaks before, or plateaus before for my um, speed work or anal anal uh, alactic work. But what I'm trying to say is, as we move closer to camp, all tempo work, position specific. Let them do patterns that are specific to their position. So I may be an offensive lineman, I may pass set for five yards on a diagonal pattern, turn around and finish the, and complete the tempo work or complete the tempo run in a straight linear fashion. Or I can do cut tempo runs. But now I start adding in change of direction work or position specific work. And position specific work is gonna be different for everybody. For a DB, I may back pedal 15 yards, turn and break at a 45 degree angle, sub-maximally, and then turn and finish the tempo work. So I think that's the value if you have a well-developed aerobic system and it's progressed throughout the year and it starts off at linear and starts off with a 35 second rest interval and then starts to progressing to increase in difficulty, then it, you don't have to worry about lactate. And tempo work can be done millions of different ways. It's just not straight ahead. I can add a cut. I can add a position specific. I can do med ball throws after. I can do body weight exercises after so for intraset recovery mode. There's many different ways to do tempo work. Just don't lock yourself in to one way. This is how it has to be. That, that, no, this is not how it has to be. You're making it that way. There's multiple variations of everything. So don't say this is, this is the best exercise or this is the best way to do it. There is no one best way. We operate in an area of gray in everything we do as physical preparation coaches because it all depends. It all depends on the individual. It all depends on, is my nervous system recovered? I tell my guys, I've told everybody, you have three maxes. You have competitive max, which is what they train for in a competitive environment. You have a, a testing max, which is the biggest mistake I think college strength coaches make is they have this max effort day, mm. max on day, and it's done under a highly emotional climate or environment. All right, I understand that. Are you gonna repeat that same environment every training day? That's literally what I said about this whole Wisconsin. I don't know if you saw it online, but the fucking University of Wisconsin on their social media, they put out their head strength coach. They had lights, literally strobe lights, turned the music, turned the lights off, white and red strobe lights, okay. uh, a DJ, and the kids were wearing masks when they were squatting. And that was exactly what I said on social media. I was like, you're going to do that every other squat session because now you have an inflated max. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. It, no, you're exactly right. It's an inflated max and you can't train off it. You know, if you establish a new PR, you can't train off it right away. No, your 80% is your real 90, and you're going to get buried. Exactly. You've got to, to let the body adjust. So they, they talk about, you know, we've got to stimulate, adapt, stimulate, adapt. How about this? Stimulate, adapt, stabilize. Stimulate, adapt, stabilize. Mm -hmm. The last thing you have to understand is you have a daily estimated training max. Nervous system can fluctuate by 18% every day. In a bench press, that's... 18 kilograms, almost 40 pounds on a daily basis because we have them for an hour or two hours a day. What are they doing the other 22 hours? They're gonna affect their body's ability to recover between bouts of intensive work. When you train, you train the uh, cardiac, cardiopulmonary, detoxification, hormonal, hormonal, metabolical, central nervous system, neuromuscular system, uh, immune systems. Those are all systems that are affected by stress and not all those systems recover at the same point in time. So don't outrun the slowest system to recover. That's why Charlie's high-low approach and what James Smith brought to light, high-low approach, is so beneficial. Because on those low days, you're increasing the ability to handle volume of work. You're also forebrain dominant. You're able to think about what you're doing. So on the hind brain or the high CNS or the high days, you can rehearse those activities that you've ingrained into your system by doing it 
sub-maximally at a high level. But then, then it goes for everything. So now we're, we've finally got a staff here uh, uh, this year that understands the high-low approach in practice too. That's awesome. You can have a high-low approach in the weight room, but if it doesn't match what's going on in the field, <laughs> it's pretty much fun. The window. <laughs> yeah, you, you just throw it out the window. Uh, but our new head coach, uh, Jonathan Gannon, understands that. JG understands that. So we put in into place with Shay Thompson and Kyle Sammons uh, the high-low approach in practice too, because it must mimic what you do in the weight room. And the problem is, is again, we've had ten weeks to secure that adaptation to the high-low approach. Then you go and leave the guy, that shit goes out the door. So now, I call it, and I stole this uh, term off of Lauren Landau, who was with the, with the Denver Broncos for a couple of years, has his own performance center in Denver. It's adaptation confusion, because now you take them to the far end of the spectrum. This is where they're the, what they've been used to, and now you're going to introduce all new concept. I'm going to run you in the sand. Why the fuck are you running in the sand? We're not playing in the sand. I have never understood that. Sand destroys the elastic reactive response, uh, causes you to stay on the ground for a longer period of time because the ground gives, so you dissipate forces. You take short, choppy steps. Yeah. Take short, choppy steps against somebody that takes that long first step in uh, meters or 60 or 40, and you're done. The same thing with a, the same thing with a fucking foot ladder that everybody calls a speed ladder. And you know I have to hit on this. And I'm going to hit on this to the day I fucking die. I'll be with you. <laughs> it's just it's teaching people to go, throw choppy steps, go nowhere fast. <sighs> no force is produced at the hip. I'm stealing something off of Boo Schnecksnader, who I have a world of respect for. Boo said, if, uh, if, pian if, if, uh, oh, wait a if foot speed equated to running speed, then piano players would have the fastest fastballs. Mm -hmm. And as my good friend James Smith says, those spacings on the foot ladder mimic the stride length of a toddler. <laughs> now, I will get out the foot ladder, and here's what I use it for, shoulder rehab. Ooh. Make it a weight-bearing shoulder activity, because yeah. the shoulder's a non-weight-bearing joint, so make it weight-bearing. So yeah. do the icky shuffle with your hands. Do in and out within your, within your hands. I have my guys plyometrically in and out, in and out, all the way up and back. And that's the only time I'll ever pull out a foot ladder. You want to develop foot speed, develop the elastic re active response off the ground. You know, it's, it's not always about fiber composition, the amount of uh, white to red, twitch fiber, uh, muscle fiber. It also comes down, I hate to break the news everybody, elasticity, mm -hmm. elastic response off the ground. If you look at all Ken Clark's research and you listen to people like Dan Path, and I'm fortunate to have a close relationship with CDNA. So anytime I'd write an acceleration or speed program, I send it to him and let him red pen it. I'll explain my thought process and he'll tell me if I'm right or wrong. I don't want him to say, yeah, that looks great, B. Don't want that. Just start red penning the thing. I send him videos of Kyler Murray and guys doing dribbling. Is that, nope, not yet. Not doing it, keep him walking. I finally sent him one of Kyler and he says, now he's getting it. Now I got the rolling foot contact because <clears throat> Dribbling is not many high knees. It's not what it is. No. It's a step over. And it starts from the ankle, which is circular motion, to the uh, calf, which is more elliptical, to the knee, which is really elliptical, which is like, when I tell people they go over the knee, it's like sitting and taking a six foot six individual and put them on a bike and putting the seat down low. That's dribbling over the knee. So, and like anything, if you give people cues, Justin, those cues, like anything, body, they accommodate it. Gets dirty like a t-shirt, like Dan says. Yep, Got to get rid of And not, not just Q is going to work for everybody. But, you know, the longer I'm in this profession, the more I realize I don't know shit, <laughs> to be honest with you. Which is why my best... Yet you're so much that. better than literally 95% of coaches out there. I mean, just, again, the things that you're talking about, like, these are all things that our members and our listeners need to continue to hear because, like you said, it's the... Uh, personal terrorists and it's the other people out on social media that are doing these things with people like oh look at this footwork quick it's like no that's not the tried and true you need people that have the ability in these high roles i think one of the best things ever was when Devonte adams was still with the packers he was uh he got asked something in an interview and he's like i don't do those things i run routes in the off season like that's how i get better at running routes exactly <laughs> like put your foot in the ground accelerate get away from somebody 
always return to linear acceleration first and put that in place. After linear acceleration, and I'm not a fanatic on cone drills, I think they're brain numbing, uh, I think they're mind idling, they're program planned and predicted, but they do expose the structure and tissues to forces they may encounter as we progress into more intensive work or more specific work. So I think they, they need to be put back in place. And there's basic, like, I'll teach a 45, 90, 135, and reverse pivot around a cone, that's it. That's about as, as cone drill as I get. But once you start running routes, that's all they need. And if you use routes sub-maximally in tempo work, all you're doing is perfecting the route pattern, are you not? So that when you go to rehearse it at a high speed, it's better. We took, uh, last year I, when I was training Zach Ertz, we compared his route running from the year before and to the last year when he was running his routes, he was running, uh, uh, creating greater uh, distance between him and the defensive back, but finishing his routes two yards further because his ability to put force into the ground had improved drastically. And it wasn't for, I mean, there was stuff he can do in the weight room, but it was just from actually doing true speed work and true acceleration work where those special qualities of the nervous system, those special strengths that we've developed on the field. So there's gonna be, there has to be just in a balance in training. It ain't all about the weight room. And what people forget, and don't get me wrong, please, I love the weight room more than anybody. I've com I competed in bodybuilding for 30 years. Uh, I retired at the age of 51. I did three shows in four, four weeks, which was, which was brutal to begin with. I'm sure um, it was. Are you kidding me? Oh, you have no idea. Fuck. I, I got yeah, to. No. I think the last week before the first show, I squatted 315 for like 16 reps. My legs were probably one of my better body parts. Now I'm like, I fucking look like Pee Wee Herman from the waist down. But the last, the last week before the last show, which is four weeks later, I was squatting 135 for sets of eight and fucking struggling. And I'm like, this guy can't go no more. And um, so I, I love the weight room. But what people don't understand is this. It's only one of the qualities or traits that need to be developed to be an athlete. We're still sportsmen. People forget that. There is no one best exercise for anything. The problem with us as human beings comes down to this, the brain. Mm -hmm. Our brains are hardwired for novelty and stimulation. So we're always looking to be stimulated, which is why cold showers are great because it increases the dopamine response. We all want that dopamine response. And sometimes people get that, to that oh, that exercise looks cool, I wanna do that. When Tommy Mazinski and I came out to Arizona 2001, and we came out here for one, one specific reason, I was about to meet with Jay Schroeder, because we were fascinated with what Adam Archuleta was doing. So now you see all this information and research, Justin, on isometrics, EQI, eccentric quasi-isometrics, if you think about it, any slow lowering of heavy load, whether it be eccentric or concentrically, is a quasi-isometric, if you think about it. Yep, 100%. So we learned, we learned a couple different ways from Jay, Dre, Jay how to do it. We learned about isodynamic work, you know, all the stuff that was written in D.B. Hammer's um, the book. All that stuff Tommy and I saw back in 2001 and started using it. Nowadays, you see all this research and people are like, oh, this is the greatest thing. I'm like, fuck, no it's not. It's been around for 100 fucking years. Anything new is old. When I was growing up in the back of comic book magazines, there was a Charles Atlas program. Charles Atlas program was all isometrics. First time I ever started training, I did isometrics. Wall sits, isometrics. I had a very smart track coach that, yeah, we started doing, we call them Russian leans. It wasn't called the Nordic hamstrings, it was called Russian leans back in the day. And he put us on a hill. So as we gradually got stronger, we just started lowering the inclination of the hill. You're the second person that said that. Fuck, who said that? It's not rocket science. It's not no. new. They've been around for a thousand years. Everything has been around for a long time. I learned isometrics back in the day. Back in, Jesus, fuck, we used to put the stack on the universal bench press machine and just get under and push against the handle as hard as we could. Jay does it uh, uh, backwards, quote unquote. He goes isometric, eccentric, concentric, correct? Right, yes, yes. And I do the same yeah. exact thing. Like it's not the Cal Deitch triphasic way. It's like, no, get really good no. in the position, get down there and then, yeah. Position first. So it becomes okay. isometrics first to teach position. People talk about, let me put it to you this way. 
I don't believe in corrective exercises. I think it's a waste of time. You know what's corrective? An isometric hold. Learn to position. It really is. Because all the corrective exercise is, is all a dysfunctional motor pattern is, is the brain trying to find a route of mm. what it perceives to be a danger. The brain's going to look at the external environment one of two ways. It's either dangerous or it's safe. If that perceives as a danger, then the brain's going to find a compensatory route around it. So one of the best ways to get the brain's attention to me is teach a position, put them isometric contracted position, isometric hold. Yeah, shut I that overprotective that. parent off, right? Yeah, exactly. Let the brain know it's okay to be in this position. You know, it's a, eh. listen, we all look for the perfect model. And I understand the perfect model. We're not all going to fit that perfect model. Everybody has a solution. Their bodies will have a solution that has found the best way that works for them at that point in time. So when you go through the process of rehab, I don't get carried away to correct things that are eventually going to prove over time. When you first start running somebody and they've had a knee injury, it's going to look like a fast walk. It's going to look like shit. <laughs> The brain's going to develop a pattern or solution, a solution to solve that problem. That's what athletics is. It's just us, our ability to solve problems, external problems in the environment. That's going to change constantly. Their jump strategies are going to change. Are going to change. You'll see somebody jump and you'll be like, yeah, he slingshotted. Here's what it looks like. But as long as it's changing over time and they're getting better, I don't, I don't panic about it because I know over time it will. You can try and rush it, but everybody's an individual. Sometimes a rush might not be the best thing in the world, you know? But what I'm just trying to say is use isometrics. Get the brain's attention. Use yielding. Use overcoming. Let the body understand what the position should be and let them get the brain's attention so the brain can start to self-organize and figure things out. You don't need corrective exercises half the time. It's just a waste of time. Will you go yielding or overcoming first? I like yielding first. I think uh, of all the contractions, and understand this, on this level, by the time these guys get to this level, they've seen everything. They've seen a ton of volume. They've seen almost all concentric work. Where are the two contractions where you'll get the most bang for your buck? Because now the room for improvement went from here down to here. There's a minute, very slight area for improvement with these guys. I think getting the brain's attention and you use an ISO yielding first is the best. Uh, and that's my opinion, because the brain patterns all three contractions differently from the ISO. I think also the benefit of using isometrics is besides improving rate coding, you improve the relay station between eccentric and concentric activities or mm -hmm. contraction. So yeah. now you're going to improve or shorten the electronic, electronic, electric, electronic, electric, electrical mechanical delay. So I'm trying to say you'll shorten the electrical mechanical delay, which is the actual onset of the, contra the, the, the contraction, the lag time between the actual onset and the actual contraction. There's a lag time between there from that action potential that you can shorten that. And I think that's done through improving the relay station, which is the isometric contraction. So I love ISOs. I've been doing ISOs forever. We've been doing ISOs out here forever. Same thing with eccentric work. We've been doing it. But I like to go isometrics first, learn the position, then go to eccentrics, yep. and then go to dynamic work. And that's the way I've always programmed. But again, <clears throat> that's how we want it to be done, but that's not how it's always done because I don't have control over who they choose Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you guys about our sponsor, Team Builder. If you have any online training platform needs, Team Builder is the go-to place. Team Builder has the ability to integrate with velocity-based training tools. They have the ability to program and have notes and videos for all of your athletes and your clients. This is your number one stop shop. Been using it since 2019 when I was working at Towson. So I've used it, love it. Make sure you check it out. Go ahead, click the link down in the description. And with that, let's get back to the show to be their, their personal terrorist in the offseason or, or their preparation uh, person getting ready for the season. And again, it's not put in place by the time you get here. It's not going to be put in place during the season. It's impossible. So once he starts, I start yeah, especially like with everything the travel to the development. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
they're going to be all over the place. I once asked, I love Louis. Uh, in 1997, I had an epith epiphany, and it came from uh, meeting Louis Simmons, uh, Charles Poliquin, and then mm. uh, Louis actually got me introduced to Charles Francis. So those all three at guys one time, or just life, right? different different times? Different times, but within like three or four months. Wow, that's awesome. Because when I went back to Pitt in 96, I actually had an assistant for the first time. My first 10 years coaching, I didn't have an assistant. It's just you. It was back in the day. Well, yeah, it was just me. When, uh, until, I think, 94, 84, when they started with the scholarship rule, you take 150 guys to camp. I had like a 3,000 square foot weight room at the University of Pittsburgh in the back of the locker room. I just had to schedule guys all throughout the day. You were responsible over 100 guys. And even back then, I knew you can't train everybody the same. There's different qualities or hierarchy of qualities that each position needs. And I realized that one day sitting in a staff meeting with, with Coach Sherrill, and Coach Sherrill asked Coach Moore, or asked me, he goes, how's he doing in the weight room? I said, getting strong. He says, he looked at our offensive line coach, the late Joe Moore, he says, how's he doing? He says, stinks. He ain't doing ain't any better. I'm not, right then I realized, it ain't all about strength. There's a lot of other things that I can help these guys put in place to help them improve their performance on the field. So, um, yeah, I realized that a long time ago. You can't train everybody the same. And everybody has these hierarchical qualities that needed to be addressed. And that's why I've never written the same program for everybody. And I never will. But uh, I forget what I was talking about. Shit. That's what happens when you get older. You said you were talking about the 150 athletes and you were bringing them in um, often during... Oh, yeah. So I, I went back to pick a 97. I had my first assistant, Mark Costick. And Mark goes to me, you know who Louis Simmons is? And I'm like, No. I really don't. I don't pay attention to powerlifting. You know, you know, I was just bodybuilding and working in a rehab clinic. So he gave me a couple articles. I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty fucking good. I wonder if we can get him out of here. So I called, and Louie talked to me, and I started talking to Dave Tate. You know, Louie never left Columbus, Ohio, very solemnly. Really? So Dave Tate convinces, convinces Louie to come to Pitt for a day. For three hours, I got my ass ripped. Uh... <laughs> And I'm like, oh boy. And what's surprising to me was, is I'm walking out the door and Dave grabs my arm and says, don't worry about it, he likes you. So I said, Louie, I need to understand where you came from. And he sent me all his articles from Pilot in USA. I bought the book, Science and Practice of Strength Training, that, uh, Zatzorski's book. Great book. And I went to visit, I called Penn State University. I remember I'm from Pitt. Die hard blue and gold. Mm -hmm. For me to walk on a state campus is pure blasphemy. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it, it can't happen, but it did. So I called and got in touch with Dr. Zatzorski, and a couple of weeks later, myself and Chad Hutsko, I went on back to Pitt. We're traveling to Penn State to meet Dr. Zatzorski, which is where I really first heard about force plates and what he was doing in his biomechanics lab. So that, that was 97? That was 97. That changed my life meeting Louie. And from Louie, the next thing I know, Tommy Mizinski and I are traveling, are traveling out to Westside, Columbus, Ohio to visit Louie because he invited us out. First day we, we go into Westside, and it's the old Westside, which is on Demarose Road. I'm watching Chuck Bogopoul do a seat of good mornings with 500 pounds for 10 reps. And I turn to Tommy, I'm like, oh, we're in a different fucking world. I don't know yeah. I'm fucking, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Kenny Paris is laying up doing dumbbell tricep extensions with fucking 100 pound dumbbells. And I'm like, holy fuck, is this a whole new world? But from Louis, I got, I got to meet Charlie Francis and started talking to Charlie. I have a notebook at home. I don't know where it is. Every conversation I ever had with Charlie is in that book. I still have his speed trap and his uh, speed training book here with his personal cell phone in it. You better go find that book. I still have it. Right? Now, the other one, the other one is, I think it's my mother's house. Yeah, I stored in um, in our garage here in a, in a couple of boxes. I don't have all my books in this room, but those guys changed my life. Uh, I went to the 97, I went to the Mega Power Conference in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was Louis Simmons and Charles Poliquin. There's maybe 50 people in, in attendance. There was myself, my assistant, Mark Costick, a good friend of mine who I'm very close with, Michael Hope, who's a PT, who's one of my go-to guys when I got issues or I call. Uh, in the center, there was one other strength coach there. It was Mike Mondi, who was a BC at the time. 
So there was three strength coaches. Everybody else was just personal trainers. That's all it was. And I learned more in those two fucking days. Or was it, I think it was one day that I've ever learned in my entire life. And that's why I started going back and forth visiting West Side. So I started reading all of Charlie's stuff. So I started calling and asking Charlie questions. Those people opened up my eyes. And that's when I started reading more and more and realized what I do realize, I realize the extensiveness of what I don't know. And when we talk about training, it's just not about the musculoskeletal system. It's about multiple systems and how they support each other and how they handle the stresses of training. It's more about the endocrine response and the hormonal response that we're all after. But there's so much more to know. It's not even funny, Justin. And there's times that I do get overwhelmed, especially now with all the data you collect. You can either be data-driven or data-aware. I'm aware of the data. I'm not driven by it. It's not going to happen. Like I look at it every fucking day, uh, but I do look at you know the videos we take of players, and it's constant problem solving. You have to each, each athlete is a puzzle you have to solve, and I don't think anybody really has the answers. I know there's a lot of people out there who think they have the answers, but then you start dealing with individuals, you know that doesn't apply to this guy. No, it really doesn't. I went first time I when I first came out here, Stu McMillan always talks about I was over at Altus as much as I was in. Arizona Cardinals facility and yeah. I have a little notebook and I took a thousand notes watching those guys coach the first thing I noticed about Dan is he's a great problem solver and he's a great observationist he saw things I couldn't see and I was like Jesus I got a lot of I went to dinner one night with Carlo, yeah. Carlo Boscelli Dan and Klein Monsinski and myself I didn't eat I just took fucking notes I didn't say a word I didn't say a word for two hours I just sat there and I said, can you repeat that again? One, one more time? What was that again? I was just writing shit in a book. And I still refer to that uh, that book when I go home sometimes. You'll get up in the middle of the night and I have post-it notes by my by the bed. My wife will tell you, I have post-it notes everywhere. Because you may get an idea, and at my age, you don't want to lose it. Trust me. What does that mean about me, then, if I got this? Yeah, 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 here they are. When it comes, it comes quick. And it doesn't stay that long. No. Constantly writing notes down in books. I have notebooks on my fucking desk here. They're all full with notes. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm taking notes what people say. I'm like, and it, what irritates me, really irritates me, is when I don't know it. I'm like, how come he knows that and I don't? And then I get pissed at myself. So then I got to go start going back through things and looking through things over and over again. You know, I look at... I think I went, I spoke at the National Hockey League's convention, to, I think it was last year or the year before. It was Marco out in Florida. And I got to meet a guy who I have a lot of a tremendous respect for. I was following him for months, Les Spellman. And as Les Spellman mm -hmm. was like, why the fuck don't I know this? So I started calling Les. Les and uh, Cece sat in my office one day, and I'm like, these guys are on a new level. They're on another level that I have to get to. So, you know, every day is a challenge. I think should be a challenge for all of us in physical preparation is just to be better than what you were the day before. Find one, one thing that you didn't know and look at everything that you're 100% certain of and question it. Go back and question it. When you're certain of something, I always go back. It's like Mark Twain said, once I find myself on the side of the vast majority, it's time to take a step back and reflect. And that's what I've been able to do my entire career. It takes to, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting, I'm my worst critic. I'm constantly writing notes to myself, constantly thinking, why didn't I know that? And then I gotta go back and start researching things. I was doing that before you called me. I'm like, fuck, I didn't know that. I better find out why I didn't know that. And I'll go back and reread re things. In my age, a lot of guys I know my age just kind of sliding off into the, into the sunset. I'm not gonna do that. I wasn't. That's my, my responsibility is to do the best I can for the athletes I'm responsible for. So I'm constantly trying to upgrade my knowledge because your athletes are your responsibility. You limit your, you limit your knowledge, you limit your abilities, limit your abilities and limit the development of your athletes. And what's your job? Develop your athletes. But the, the, the data stuff, don't get me wrong, it drives me nuts sometimes. It becomes Same. overwhelming. Oh my gosh. It becomes too fucking overwhelming for me and I got to so take much. a step back. Yeah, I gotta take a step back. I'm like, leave me alone with that shit. I don't want to see it today. i already, my mind is already working overtime. I don't want to fucking see it right now. <laughs> I took, they did Kyler Murray's uh, force play yesterday. I waited till this morning to look at it. 
I'm like, I'm not ready for this yet. I'm not ready for it. I watched him jump. I saw I saw him slingshot. I saw some things. I saw his first jump. He bent more at the waist. So he recruited from his lower back when he jumped. Uh, back extension. I'm like, I'm not ready for everything else yet. I just got it. I just started looking at it today. And what I do, I put it in a fucking folder and send it up to Matt Jordan. <laughs> they say, Matt, I'll pay you for this. But yeah, I need some help here. So I'm waiting to hear back from Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that is, that is what Dango good. said you used to do that to him too though like if he'd ask you a question you'd be like ah not today yet motherfucker like yeah exactly I would say I'm not ready for that fucking yet my mind doesn't work I would tell him that yeah I'm not ready for that don't ask me that question or if you're going to ask me don't expect an immediate response you have to give me time to think about it and there's a lot of shit in his brain after 66 years and 43 being involved in his profession sometimes somebody hmm. will say something I'll go oh yeah we did that back in like 1980. We were doing that. It's like when I first, people started talking about med balls. I'm like, yeah, I had med balls at Pitt. In 1980, we should throw them around. They were the leather ones. Remember the old leather ones? We had the old leather had med balls. We had them in the weight room. So make guys throw them back and forth. Try and knock the guy over with it. Try and throw it through his chest. But we started Now that's like balls. the new cool thing to do. <clears throat> no, no. Yeah, there's, like I said, anything new is old. There's nothing out there that I haven't seen. The only thing I haven't seen is all this data nonsense. And that is the thing. It is nonsense because you can become overwhelmed. It, it, it kind of can oversaturate it. I feel like it's the pendulum is eventually going to swing back the other way where people get rid of it. Do you agree or no? Is it here to stay? Um, I think it's here to stay, to be honest with it. So like old, old guys like me just have to deal with it. I can look at a guy right now knowing I don't, I don't need to jump in. I know he's gassed. I can just watch him. My first assessment is when guys come in and they start doing tissue prep. They're using a foam roller as a pillow. Or they're just laying at you and looking at you with dead eyes. And you turn the music on and nothing happens. Yeah, You gassed. better be prepared to change. Just because it's on paper doesn't mean it needs to be done. There's always the, there's three opinions. There's the opinion of the athlete. There's opinion of the coach, and the athlete always has perceptual awareness, not physiological readiness, or perceptual readiness, not physiological readiness. They know their perceptual readiness and what they perceive to be the readiness. Because you always get guys that say, oh, I feel good, I feel good. I'm like, really? Because you look like shit. And the last is the opinion of the athlete's body. Who are you going to listen to? The athlete's body will talk to you as they move. The question now becomes, am I listening? Is it really a dysfunctional movement pattern, or is it just what he does? Andre de Grasse, that left arm goes straight when he sprints. I was talking to Chidi a couple of weeks ago, and I always have these, Chidi always makes me aware of a lot of things, but he was talking about uh, Shelly Fraser Price. Uh, and he says when she first came, she was smoking everybody, but she had a forward head lean, she had big backside mechanics, and over time, she cleaned it up. But he goes, you can still look across the track to this day and say, that's Shelly Ann Fraser Price. I know how she moves. Because people are gonna move distinctly to what works for them. There's the model, we all work to the model, but there's also bandwidth. Or like Chi tells me, there's negotiables and there's non-negotiables. So what are the negotiables? This is what we can negotiate with, this has to be here. Everybody's talking about, I understand, force in a short amount of time. Don't get me wrong. And everybody, I think we're going down a rabbit hole with all this stiffness and force production. And I'll tell you why. And I've thought about this for a long time. If that isn't expressed in the right angles at the right moment, you're still going to run slow. So I think we're chasing things that are putting the cart before the horse. You know, I think people get too carried away. Oh, did you see that foot placement? It was off a little bit. Like, yeah, fuck, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, because it's going to be perfect in a game, right? Like, not, yeah, nothing's going to be perfect in a game. So now let's get back to periodization. You have a game plan, right? Hmm. Does that game plan go according to plan? Or they make adjustments at halftime? It's the same thing your plan is for the day. It's a plan. That's all the fuck it is. There was, a, I had a quote, I used to hang, I, I don't know what I did with it, Justin. There was from a British officer on the D-Day invasion, and the quote went something like this. Nothing is going to go according to this plan in this chaos of this invasion. So when you get on the beach, 
just find me. That's all the quote was. I'm like, isn't that apropos? That's fucking, that's periodization right there. There's the sheet. This is what the plan is for today. I don't expect it to go like this, nor should you. No. I don't know how you can think you can precisely predict and this is where the whole NSCA is going to get all fucking pissed and tight ass on me again. How can you predict the outcome, the precise outcome, over 16, 12, 8 weeks of a highly complex, multifactorial organism like the human body? How do you think you can predict that? The road to Rome was built, but it took a while. There were potholes. So, like James Smith used to say all this time, all roads lead to Rome. Yes, they do. Some of them are more curved. Some of them are more, more pothole. But eventually you'll get there. Like Charlie used to say, eventually you'll get what you're training for if you keep training for it. Eventually over time. But the thought that you can precisely predict where somebody's going to be, to me, that's a little ludicrous. That's why I don't like training for max days. If you're feeling good, no. you just set a match. No. He just set a new PR in a workout. So back him up a little bit and get him the hell out because he's done for today. Where else is he going to do? <laughs> he's going to go higher and let them stabilize. Don't start training off that new PR right away. Give the body time to stabilize and accept its newfound levels. And if you do that, I'm, I'm for, I always tell people, consistency and continuity are the keys to training. It's not intensity. You can only train intensity for so long. It's being consistent and be having some continuity in your program. Don't go looking all over the place because you'll drive yourself nuts. Well, this worked for him. Well, that's great. That worked for him. Might not work the same for you. You got identical twins on the same program. They're not going to have the same outcome. So stop looking for the magic bullet theory. It doesn't exist. As long as you have principles and keep those principles in line, then you can work around everything else. And that's how Why I. Why do you think so many from, coaches guess, don't let them stabilize? Why do you think so many coaches I, don't like stick with the stabilization? Sorry, this is the way. I think that's a great question. And in the old days, I was always wanting more and more, you know, to prove to myself that I was a great strength coach. I think it was uh, new head coaches, especially in college, are guilty Ooh, of that. Point. You know, well, they're not working hard. Nobody's throwing up. I don't see anybody bombing. You know, you got to grind them into the ground. So guys spend too much time. And again, guys got to go justify their program by going upstairs and saying, look, he went from a 300-pound bench press to a 365-pound bench press. Did he get any better on the field? That's not necessarily going to equate to being better on the field. You know, help him over the long haul. But it may not be the reason he gets better. There's multiple reasons why people get better. I'm a, I think... Chasing a heavy squat will adversely affect your sprint performance. There's no question in my mind about that. And I think chasing a heavy squat or just you got somebody, you got to keep his bench at 400 pounds. How much bigger do you think it's going to make him if he gets to 410? Is it really worth chasing that extra five pounds? How about working on some other quality that he needs to work on to help become a better sportsman in his activity? Make that decision. Don't always chase an almighty number. Because you may be highly disappointed. So I tell people, if your goal, if your life's pursuit, if it's all you've ever dreamed of, to get to this level, you're going to be highly disappointed. You're going to be a failure. Because you're not going to get here. It's by luck I got here. You know, things have to line and fall into place. And I still tell people, I'm just lucky to still fucking be here. You know, I may change tomorrow. <laughs> I may be asked tomorrow to leave. But it... it, it you know, like I tell people, I don't know how the fuck I'm still here. Don't know. Especially if there's four different head coaches and four different staffs. Just fortune, I guess. But it's a constant pursuit of knowledge and getting better that I think separates the great ones from the average ones. I'll do something not till I get it right. I'll do it till I don't get it wrong. And I think that's, that's a significant difference in people. I'll keep studying it until I don't get it wrong. Not about getting it right. I just don't want to get it wrong. That's my goal. And that's why I, I try to read something every day. Now, I will tell you this. At my age, that reading may be a precursor to a nap. So 
you know, my head starts to bob. It's time to turn my chair to the door and put my feet up on the wall and fucking grab about 15 or 20 minute nap. <laughs> People don't realize this. When I turned 60, I told my wife this, and I told both my daughters. I don't know where my energy level went, but fuck, is it suffered. And the older, I don't even want to see 70. Fucking don't want to see it. <clears throat> but the older you get, you need a little break. And you can't ask me a question and expect me to come up with an answer right then and there. It's not going to work. Like your dad said, you got to give me time about that. You got to give me time. You got to let me think. got to let me go through everything that's in my brain or what I've done over my lifetime. And like I said, I do not know everything. I'll be the first to admit it. Be the first to admit it. I'm not going to fucking bullshit you. I'm just going to tell you. I don't know that. Don't fucking know it. I got to go learn it. So I think that's what helps separate the great ones from the average one. As long as you're able to willing to learn and you keep your mind open and understand, you're going to change your opinion on everything a couple times. You know, I got away from isometrics, now I'm back to isometrics. I got away from eccentrics, now I'm back to eccentrics. We first started talking to Cal Dietz about eccentrics and isometrics back probably 2006 before he came out with triphasic. We talked about it at the at Napster, Illinois, where Dr. Bondarchuk was speaking and Dr. Yesus was translating for him. Down to Sedkin was there and a couple other people. And a couple other people and coaches were there. Milo and I went to that in Napster, Illinois. And that's when we first started talking about it. the value of just doing eccentric work, the value of just doing isometric work, the value of having blocks of those. And I think I would like to say that's where Cal Dietz got all started shifting towards his triphasic training. But Cal does it eccentric, isometric, and uh, dynamic work. I like, I like, I prefer isometric work first. It's great for teaching position. It's great for motor unit activation. But more importantly, it's great to improve that relay, that time delay, that shortening electromechanical delay between those two contractions, which is why I really like it. And I've, let me, I, I'm helping Kyler Murray right now and, and Zach Ertz. I have them holding the split squat for up to a, under 90 seconds now, loaded. You know, I'll put a bar on your legs and a split squat and have them don't move for 90 seconds. And I've, I've seen them do it. I've, but again, Not fun. Yeah, here's what's, what I need to, need to improve upon is I'm in Arizona. I've been here for 10 years. Jay Schroeder's two miles away. You know, Eos used to be a Golds gym. I used to walk my ass over there and reintroduce and talk to him more about this stuff because he had it figured out back in the day. He really did. He had, he had a lot figured out. And I got to give him credit for that because he understood the value of isometrics and eccentrics back, way back. Funny, when I was at the University of Buffalo, we had a kid who played for us, Jeff Blue Balve. And his aunt lived in Arizona. So his aunt would pay Jay to train him during the summer months and stay, stay at UB. He handed me a sheet of workouts once, and I got to find them. But I remember one of them was three sets of one eccentric back squat. Three sets of one. Didn't matter the load. I think Jeff used 225. Lower that fucking thing for 60 seconds. That exact little slower on a, on a, on a rear foot elevated split squat for 40 seconds. And it was brutal. Can't even imagine doing it for 60 seconds. Remember, remember I don't want to do something for eight seconds. No. Back in the day, Arthur Jones talked about uh, mm. 60 seconds. Take 60 seconds to lower yourself from a chin. I remember those days back in the day. I got to about 20 seconds. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> That's it. It's all the slower. I'm coming down. But there's nothing new out there. And I think if you continue to look at evidence-based research, that's great too, but that evidence-based research is only as good as the next evidence-based research article to come out. So you got to keep reading. you got to stay up on things. And like I said, it's as much as an art as it is as a science, to be honest with you. I prefer being an artist than a scientist. I get the science. I understand it. But I still rely on my eye. I still rely on some of what my gut tells me. And I've learned more from guys like Brett Fisher and K2, who's over at Charles Bentley's place, guys like Dan Path, Bush Next Night, or Matt Jordan, those guys, Louie, Char the late Charles Polk, and those guys, even John Meadows taught me a lot. Those guys have enabled me to enhance my learning tenfold. Yeah, I learned a lot from John. I spoke at a 2015 um, elite conference, and I was shocked at 
the guy knew who I was, <laughs> to be honest with you. Because I had seen him a year before backstage at Nashville. Uh, when Nationals were in Pittsburgh, because that's where Jimmy Mannion's a good friend of mine, the NPC Physique Chairman. So the Nationals are held every year in Pittsburgh. I used to go to Nationals all the time. I'm backstage, and I'm looking at John Meadows. I'm like, holy fuck. You know, and then next year we went to the Elite, I spoke at the Elite um, Conference, and he actually knew who I was. And I remember just standing off to the side looking at him. So I introduced myself. I'm like, nope, stay away from him. It's fucking contest time. I'm not even going to go near any of these guys. But I remember watching him pump up in the back room, but I learned a lot from John. Absolutely did. I think everybody has an opportunity to learn from, to be honest with you. Even if it's not what to do, <laughs> you're still learning. So take advantage of every situation. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions and question everything that you're 100% sure of. Question it. Go back and question it. And that's what I'm, I've been doing right now, especially on eccentric training and the different ways that Jay talked to me about EQIs. And there was a guy before him, well, it wasn't with Jay, it was a guy named Tony Schwartz. And I forget the other, Kelly Braggett were guys. Dan Pat, I mean, um, Dan Fickner, who's, and Chris Corsif are disciples of Jay. In fact, they were probably Jay's guinea pigs back in the day. But they'll talk to you about, you'll learn a lot from a lot of people, Justin, if you take the time to put your ego aside and ask questions, to be honest with you. But when, I'm, when I get off with you, I'm going to go right back to doing some research on stuff that I didn't know. And I'm, in fact, this afternoon, I have a note to myself called Boo Schnecksnager. <laughs> well, I'll let you uh, go and, and go have the rest of that time. I mean, I've taken up a, a plenty of your time, Coach. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Plus, I, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, keep learning. Keep training. And keep understanding that we're all individuals. We're not clones yet. What works for one might not work for another. Understand it's your responsibility to find what works for people. And people are, are puzzles to be solved. Some people take a lot longer to solve than others. I'm still trying to solve some of the stuff I see with, see with Kyler Murray right now, which is why I'm calling Boo. Next up, we have Adam Meekins. Adam Meekins is a sport physio who has an outstanding opinion and is not afraid to let people know what he thinks. He does not have conventional wisdom when it comes to spinal flexion exercises or simple glute exercises. He challenges the norm and he has a great outlook on how to actually train people. Enjoy. Uh, okay, well, my name's Adam and uh, in a nutshell, I'm a physiotherapist or physical therapist, which I think you incorrectly call them over in the US. Um, have been a physiotherapist for just over 20 years. Haven't always been a physio, so I came into it as my third career. Really? So, uh, don't let these youthful looks confuse you. I've been around the block a few times. Uh, <laughs> so I came out of the uh, school system, the academic system, at a tender age of 18. I went into the military for a couple of years. Thank you for your service. Had, yeah, I had aspirations of staying in there for a long duration and a long time to make a career out of it but as things tend to happen life comes around and makes plans change um, won't go into the gory details but it let's just say it was based around a woman hmm. say no more uh, and so i left the military a little bit earlier than i anticipated came out onto cv street and didn't have a fucking clue what to do with myself uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm the fittest I've ever been, so I'm going to use that to my advantage and became a glorified personal trainer for a couple of months. Wanted to get some sort of, you know, credibility behind that title that I just bestowed upon myself. So I went to university and did a degree in sports science, which I rather naively thought would give me some more credentials and make me more employable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I came out after three years of doing that degree thinking, well, this is a fucking worthless degree. Nobody fucking understands what it is, and it's not really given me any opportunities apart from working in some professional sports clubs, which are very few and far between. Unless you've got contacts in there, you're unlikely to get your, your foot in the door. So I started carrying on. I carried on working as a glorified personal trainer who was overqualified with this degree. And... Uh, then started to come across people that had pain and injuries and that started to pique my interest, not sure what to do, how to progress with that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to start exploring a bit more down into that area. And that's what eventually led me into physiotherapy. And that was, I say, 20 odd years ago. So that's me in a nutshell. <clears throat> Why do you say that the word physio is better than physical therapist? 
because it just is. It's it sounds more glamorous. It sounds more mysterious. It sounds more, I think, scientific as well. Physiotherapist rather than a physical therapist. I agree with you. Um, what do you think is the problem with physios and? Do you like the word strength and conditioning coach or strength? What's the word you like? What's your appropriate vernacular? Well, I, I, again, I've I've bastardized my qualification to say that I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but really, technically, I'm not. I haven't done any sort of formal. I mean, but what's the difference, realistically? Like, it, well, yeah, I mean, the sports science degree I had taught me a, there was a lot of crossover, um, but it was more focused around you know exercise physiology and the science of sport kinesiology rather than just pure strength and conditioning training but there was certainly a lot of crossover but I, I suppose technically sports scientist is what my first bachelor of science degree is in and then physiotherapy is what my second one is but what i think the problem is is with physio is um well where to begin <laughs> i've got i've got lots of problems with the physiotherapy profession after working in it for two decades but i think um arrogance egotisticalness over complexity uh, taking credit for things that it doesn't deserve to take credit for claiming that it's better than other healthcare professions out there having this pompous arrogant hierarchical uh, elitist type of approach which i don't think it deserves or gets much credit or deserves much credit and yeah just just a sh shitload of stupid nonsense that infests the profession mate that's what i think is the problem with physiotherapy I agree with you um, about the hierarchy, too, because one of my buddies here is a physio, <clears throat> and we were actually talking about this the other day because, you know, a lot of these structures set it up where there's like a hierarchy where it's like, okay, immediate injury that you got, maybe if it's surgery, the, you know, surgeon's in charge, then it's the, phys the physio, then it's the ATC, and like, that's got to just be the problem with, like you said, with the degrees sucking. It's got to be academic, right? Like, how do we blow that whole thing up? I don't know how to blow it up, mate. I've been trying for years to, to get the profession to change and to recognize, you know, what it is good at and what it's not so good at and give it some sort of a little bit more honesty and humility. And I don't think I've been very successful in doing that. So I don't know how to change it. But no, I think I think a lot of physiotherapists' lack of confidence in doing the simple things really well stems for their, their inferi inferiority complexes. And I think, it, again, it's the medical system that a lot of us work in. We always feel second best or subservient to our medical colleagues, to the doctors and to the surgeons. And, and I think there's a lot of inferiority complex in physiotherapy for that. And so they try to they try to make up for that by overcomplicating and overconflating a shitload of what they do in in, a, in, a, in an attempt to what they think is a belief to to make themselves appear more medical to make them appear more more you know intelligent than they actually are and it fucking frustrates the hell out of me particularly in the UK now I'm seeing more and more physios running around pretending to be junior doctors there's a lot of heavy promotion and pushing for physiotherapists' careers to go into the medical side of it. So we're seeing a lot of young physios being promoted to you know, start talking about prescriptions, pharmacology, what? doing injections. Yeah, I mean, I've been trained in it as well. In my NHS career now, I'm a diagnostic ultrasonographer, so I've been trained to be doing radiology interventions. I've been trained to, say, prescribe medications, to do injections, all because this is what, again, a lot of physios believe this is where their skills evolve in and I do see some people doing it well but I also see a lot of the physios just say running around pretending to be junior doctors and it's embarrassing and it frustrates me a lot and the consequence of that is that a lot of the physiotherapy in the UK now has moved away from its roots which is good quality injury diagnosis pain diagnosis and rehabilitation you know there's no financial incentive or reward or career prospects for physios just to want to be good at getting people functioning and back doing what they need to be doing after an episode of pain and injury. It's all about interventions with medicines and injections and ultrasounds now. And it, it is depressing and it does frustrate me a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, you could almost say the same thing about strength and conditioning. And that's kind of why I asked you, um, but what's the difference? Because <clears throat> I'm very fortunate where I work. Um, the athletic trainer I work with, he's awesome. And I joke, uh, I say, are you a strength coach? Are you an athletic trainer? Because um, 
when I'm training the whole team, if there's somebody in a, in a return to play setting, he takes him and he's off doing what he needs to do, you know, regressing it. And, you know, Kyle, my athletic trainer, has taken the time to learn what dribbles are and learn my progressions and regressions to, to do those things. And if I'm training the whole team and he's training somebody one on one, well, isn't he technically being a strength and conditioning coach in that moment? Right. And then when we're in practice and the whole team is there and they need the ATCs monitoring everybody and I'm rehabbing somebody, well, am I being an athletic trainer or physio? Like, that's why there doesn't need to be all these silos, right? And we, we can blur the lines, no? No, I totally agree, mate. But again, it's just that inferiority complexes of not wanting to feel like you're having somebody step on your toes or take away your your skill set and it's just all that protective mentality that I think a lot of the professions tend to have. This is my role, this is what I should do, you know, this is where my skills are. Therefore, you know, you stick to what you're doing, I stick to what I do. But as you say, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of overlap and I think there's a lot to be learned from each other. You know, I, I think I've I, I class myself as a better physio for for aligning myself more with you know, strength coaches, personal trainers, athletic trainers, I find that I've learned a shitload more from them <laughs> than other than just sticking in my silo and listening to, to physios. Because I'd still be thinking, you know, I could feel sacroiliac joints out of place and trigger points and fascial adhesions. If I only carried on just listening to physios, I'd be thinking all sorts of stupid bullshit. But the fact my eyes have been opened and my, you know, horizons broaden has come from my interaction and interdisciplinary working with other professions you think it's because people are employed as educators but have never done it and haven't played sport themselves so like i was talking with my wife that the teachers for strength and conditioning profession usually never even were fucking strength coaches in their day-to-day -day. like so why in the hell should they be educating the youth yeah i think that's a part of it um, but I, 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 the reasons why people get, you know, dogmatic or you know, stuck in their ways is due to lots of different things. You know, there's a lot of cognitive fallacies that can drive people to not want to listen to ulterior motive or ulterior hypotheses and things along those lines. But I think a part of it is, you know, a lot of people, you know, they lack exposure or experience to things that they're asking other people to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I used to have a, a saying that I think, you know, it's all good for a, a physio or an athletic trainer, you know, particularly if you're demonstrating exercises, to be able to be able to do that art exercise that you ask your athletes and stuff to do. But again, mm -hmm. I think that's dependent on the type of individuals you're working with, because uh, again, I work with some very strong, very fit athletic people that are able to do a shitload of things better than I could do as a physiotherapist. So, but I do believe, you know, that practicing what you preach is important yeah um one last question before we change topics do you think that you know kind of the governing bodies continue to have that siloed approach do you think there's ever going to be a way that they can blend it and then <laughs> don't get me started on the governing bodies mate. i just did go ahead <laughs> i could get myself in a bit of hot water here because personally i think they're they're inept and they're not fit for purpose and uh, I've got myself in a lot of hot water about that, and I'm currently still in a lot of hot water about that. Oh, jeez. So yeah, I've got a couple of uh, legal proceedings ongoing at the moment in the background due oh. to some knobheads in positions of authority. Um, making my life a little bit difficult because of my views and opinions and using the authorities to their advantage. And to say that the authorities are... Let's just say that my my views and opinions on them are are not very favorable at the moment because of that. <clears throat> Sounds good. So changing topics to people that are out there in the uh, the social media world that are social media strength coaches that have never done it themselves either. What would you say to our listeners in our demographic? Right, the majority of the people listening right now are pretty young and impressionable. They're twenty four to thirty four um, men that are are trying to get into the field. Looking back, um, what would you tell anybody? Get some life experience. You know, I think at the end of the day, to be a good coach, to be a good person that's going to help other people through whatever situation you want to help them through, make them perform better or get them through a period of injury or disease, you have to have some life experience of how to interact, to communicate, to motivate, to support, to reassure people. 
uh, and that takes time to develop. There's no secret sauce to it. There is no quick one step approach to being a good coach. It takes time, it takes exposure, and it takes a variety of, say, of experiences to, to develop into a rounded human being because there is no one size fits all approach. You have to be adaptable, you have to be flexible, you have to be resilient and robust yourself, you know, both physically and psychologically. And um, it's not an easy job to do. It's, it's something that, as I say, is not suitable for everybody. And I find a lot of people sometimes, they know it's not suitable for them, yet they carry on with it for whatever reasons. Maybe it's just because it's difficult to think about jumping the fence and doing something difficult and so they dogmatically carry on to the detriment of themselves and to the people that they're they're helping and coaching and I say if you're you're, you're you're feeling like this job is you know difficult and hard work good because it is um, but if you're also feeling demoralized demotivated with it then you're in the wrong fucking job and you need to consider changing it and and the other thing is is don't think it you know you're going to seek fame and fortune or wealth through it either because this is not the type of job that does that either if you've got that mindset and that mentality you're going to be sorely disappointed it requires to say that that approach where you're sometimes you're quite happy to selflessly commit your time energy and effort to make somebody else appear better and perform better and you're not going to take any credit for that and that that takes a certain type of personality to be happy to do that you know that takes a a certain person and say a lot of people I think that are in this profession aren't those people how did you learn how to do that I haven't <laughs> <laughs> I just talk a fucking good game <laughs> touche touche because uh, I mean I'd agree with you and I think it uh, that reminds me Fernando the conversation we had with Jonas where he was talking about like he was considering going to Canada and uh, his mom wanted him to like Dr. Dodo was going to be like really important to, to her. But he's like, I just felt wrong, you know, saying that I'm, you know, a doctor of strength and conditioning speed, whatever. He's like, but I've never worked with someone that's actually fast and I've never made people fast. Like, I, I think you, you bring up a really good point there. Like, if you want to be a good strength and conditioning coach physio, you have to have actually worked with somebody and done it. And you need to do it at a point where you're probably not getting paid for your services. Right. Like. Yeah, I think um, I think I can't really speak for any other professions, but what it means to be successful in this environment has been blurred. You know, like people don't even know. It's like, is are you supposed to be knowledgeable? Um, you know, win stuff. Are you supposed to be famous? Are you supposed to be who knows? And then I think with social media, what it, what it does is, I mean, it's a good tool, but it, it's about the use it gets. You know, so people just, especially the young ones, they just see flashy bits and they just think about straight into what that looks like but nothing in between they're thinking like oh i could be young and successful and skip all these steps and like coach whichever team straight away or get all these many followers or have all this money and be you know ripped and tan and whatever it's all about it, it just it's, it's a nothing like some of those things are even like not even compatible with each other so it's this this, this orientation of of where to go or why to do something. I don't think there's a strong why. I've actually been reading that book, so I'm probably like biased to talk about that one now. But I don't think there's a strong why. People, if you ask the, the professionals, none of them will able to tell you maybe why they go in or why they're still there, why they would like to stay there. It's all about this is what I'm gonna do and this is how I'm gonna do it. But, but why, what, what's the ultimate goal? Is, is it money? Because then if you are fueled by this in you know intrinsical, um, need of you know purpose or fulfillment or whatever then who do you care who's watching your drills and why do you spend time um criticizing or fighting people over the internet like what is just going in all many directions they're pulling each other in different ways so you end up being a nothing right like that that's 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 what i feel with the 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 famous people they call themselves like the king of speed or whatever whatever is a it's a horrible blend between like marketing you know banality ego and I, I don't even know what performance is anymore to be fair hmm that's an interesting rabbit hole that we could dive down but like, that's a good point there like what is it, it, it 
Because that's the part too, though, with with you know strength and conditioning, physios. If you're working in team sport, we're always at the liberty of being fired by admin, you know, people that have no idea what we're doing. Versus if you're working, you know, ideally if you're working for private clientele, you don't have to deal with that as much. But yeah, I mean, to try to prove your worth can be difficult because you do have to sell yourself, and then that goes back into that, you know, right? Like, as you brought up the book, that's what you guys saw me turn around and do. I brought, I got this book the other day, Outlive. Have you heard of it? Anybody out there? Either of you guys? So it's talking about the science and art of longevity. Um, and the reason that I brought it up is it sounds, it says it's rethinking medicine to live better longer. And so it's again, probably going to be about the idea of like, hey, we don't need to ingest or inject things in us to, you know, get our body to optimize, um, the way it should be. What are some things, you know, Adam, that you found help out your clients, your people you work with that maybe isn't, you know, just, Hey, we're going to rice or we're going to inject you in some ibuprofen. Like what have you done to make people feel better and move better, um, overall? And then we can kind of dive into different areas of the body. Great question. And I think, you know, the, the main thing that I do 99% of the time in a lot of my evaluations and consultations now is listen to people in, and to then give them some confident reassurance that all their fears and doubts that they have got about this issue are not as bad or not to be as concerned about. So I think that's the, the number one thing that I do as a healthcare professional 99% of the time. Because when people have a pain, an injury or a problem, you know, normal human nature is for everybody to think worst case scenarios. What's going on? What's possibly could be happening? What's going to happen in the future? And so I totally get that, you know, having a recent severe bout of ridiculous issues with my own back injury hmm. 18 months ago now, um, you know, as a healthcare professional with lots of experience of helping other people through those situations, when it happened to me, my brain instantly went to worst case scenarios. So I know it's it happens to everybody in all sorts of situations. So a lot of the time, as I say, my, my biggest thing of helping people get healthy or get recovered from an injury is, is giving them reassurance after listening and giving them that sort of pathway, giving them some green light to be able to know what to progress on and what to focus on, which is basically keeping it simple as possible, not getting too distracted by all the gadgetry and the gimmickry that's out there focus on the big rocks before you start worrying about the one percenters you know as was probably all heard before a bit cheesy but it's true a lot of people say they focus on you know do i need to take this multivitamin i'm like well fucking how many grams of protein you're eating first and foremost <laughs> you know how many calories you're shuffing down your face and what your macro is looking like before you start worrying about which brand of multivitamin to get and that's the same with physiotherapy rehab you know they talk about is this corrective exercise, you know, the best one to be doing? I'm like, well, fucking, are you getting your steps in? Are you sleeping? Are you, are you doing your mobility stuff? You know, all this sort of stuff. That's the first thing before you start working about the motor control of your iliacus working at 13.5% of its MVIC. You know, that stuff comes way, way down the line, if at all, if it's ever needed. So, yeah, I think, you know, to answer that question, reassurance, listening, and focusing on the big stuff the big rocks what did you do Ooh, go ahead go ahead i imagine sometimes especially for you with injuries and, and the people coming in that some sort of desperation or, or sadness state is about and that's probably what infuriates you uh or one of the things uh is about undoing what other people have mm. done out of like you know that ego we say like why i feel important by getting someone clinging on my idea of giving them hope and all these explanations and someone's desperate when you're desperate you just, you just want to find a solution and then you'll pay whatever you have to pay for someone to you know snap your gooch and like feel better and like so it's, it's very no no, no it's, it's over those videos but it's very confusing. i know and it's, it's like you get it's like you get extorted emotionally for someone offering you a solution and this person uh might not even be trying to do that deliberately they're just like ignorant and full of themselves so they just think they can cue everyone so they just go around saying, oh, I've got the cure for everything because they actually believe it. And this this is one of the dangerous things we get in the health um, care professionals. And well, in sport, it's different because the athletes get, get promised all these things. And, and most of the time, or, or, or the biggest difficulties I've had in the last year is just 
debunking myths. You know, they, they get convinced of something, and these guys are, you know, talented or have the genetic predisposition or ability to overcome stupid stuff, and then they think that that works, and they, you know, it doesn't. So you're just trying to help them. It's just, it's just really tough. It's undoing the the ineptitude of others, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of the biggest frustrations of my job, mate. It feels like it's Groundhog Day. I keep having the same discussions with different people 20 times a day, and it is it is frustrating, and it is hard work, and it is draining emotionally for me to feel like I'm banging my head against a brick wall and making that very little progress in the grand scheme of things. But, yeah, no, it's it's trying to unpick, you know, the nocebo, the fear... The, the focus on the stuff that doesn't matter that's the hardest thing to do you know and that's why i do get frustrated at people that do continue to perpetuate these these yeah. myths on social media and people say why why are you getting so worried about this why are you getting so frustrated it's a small thing and i'm like it's not a small thing you know because this small thing that you think is inconsequential to you i've seen absolutely ruin people they focus on shit that doesn't matter they get so concerned about stuff that you've said that they can't focus on anything else. They can't see the wood for the trees now. And so, you know, I, I see it all the time, you know, the old spinal flexion debate. I, it drives me crazy that people go around demonizing this one particular part of the body's particular movement as being, you know, the most harmful or dangerous thing in the world. And it's like, why is that? Why are we start, said that spinal flexion so bad, yet we're quite happy to do elbow flexion in a myriad of different ways you know all the <laughs> exercise prescription with your bicep variations fucking hell yeah you're the top fucking snc coach and physiotherapist out there as soon as you start giving a variation of spinal flexion oh my god you're dangerous and you're harmful you're 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 being risky you're being that i'm like you've just given this guy 33 different bicep curls in all various different variations to hit all different parts of the targets of the heads why can't i do that to the spine oh it's different why is it different Show me the evidence where it's different. Show me the proof that it's more risky or dangerous. So things like this, I say, get me up on my oil horse all the time because I say around back pain, which is the number one thing I see a lot of, that the fears and the harms that people promote and say out there are, are the hardest thing for me to unpick. And it is, uh, people say, well, it's just words. Words are harmless. You know, I'm like, they're fucking not. Words are like toothpaste. Once you squeeze them out, you can't put them back into the tube. Mm. You no, know, they get out there. They get fucking ingrained. They get stuck into people's psyche and beliefs and understanding. And that's how dogma gets built as yeah. well. Because these words just keep going round and round and round. More people keep saying it. More people keep believing it. Until you know what? Everybody's saying the same thing, which is just fucking ridiculous. Because it's, it's easier and more palatable to say the, the, the stupid stuff. And then when you actually... Set yourself up for debate and like actual rational arguments then you feel yourself you are know, in a place of solitude because people start giving you the you know the fallacies of be like well you know many ways lead to rome i was like well not hmm. many it's not like everything and, and the fact that you know in, in terms of cognitive like reasoning the fact that something worked once doesn't mean it's right you can't really like normal people don't have that basic reasoning process or understanding be like oh you know what uh, this is this is my magic like tiger device. I, it fights away tigers. There's no tigers in the Midlands. Be like Fernando. There's never been tigers in the Midlands. Oh well, <laughs> you know, I've had this, and then I'm selling the tiger repelling devices. You know, like that sort of thing. And, and and we think it's funny. We think it's funny. But the same like reasoning chain is for many other stuff. Oh, you know what? And it, it end up it end up going to the fact that people say, well, in my personal experience. Which oh, is, yeah, yeah. what was that? What was that supposed to mean? Well, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So I, I do it. <laughs> like, how'd you, how did you treat your own back then? Or did you go see somebody else? No, I uh, I did what I would recommend to anybody else. Is that that's the same signs and symptoms as me is keep a watchful eye on it, give it time and keep moving. And that's pretty much what I did for a very bad bout of a posterior lateral disc herniation with radiculopathy. So it, again, I didn't go and get scans, I didn't get imaging, I didn't go and get epidurals, I didn't get massage, I didn't get manipulation because I don't believe that those things help or improve or speed up recovery. Um, in fact, I think a lot of the times they do the opposite, they impede it because normally they're surrounded by narratives of stupid shit. 
So pretty much, as I say, I treated myself as I would do everybody else, which wasn't easy to do because, as I said, my mind was racing to worst case scenarios, particularly as I was documenting it on social media and I was putting it out there for the world to see. And every cunt was giving me their un, un, unsolicited, unsolicited bit of advice yeah. and, and information. And, you know, and, and people were always thinking and telling me of the worst case scenarios. They kept reinforcing those fears and doubts that I had constantly daily repetitively so it was hard for me to sometimes try to keep my focus on what i would suggest the patient does but yeah did you did was the pain going down both legs or just one just the one it was a it was a high disc herniation so it was l3 l4 so it created a lot of groin pain it's a slightly unusual presentation for a disc herniation because it normally happens at the lower two discs mine happened at a higher disc level so it created what I call not sciatic type symptoms, it caused thematic symptoms. It was anterior thigh pain rather than posterior thigh pain. A lot of groin pain uh, affecting the, say, the higher nerve roots up there and a loss of quad strength rather than calf strength. So mm. I lost about 50% of my left quad, which was really fucking concerning. That absolutely, that, 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 I mean, pain, I can sort of, you know, go, all right, fair enough, take and live or take with it. But when I started feeling motor deficits, muscle weakness, that very much made me go, fuck you yeah, now, all right, this is, this is something else I've got to be more concerned about because that doesn't always recover. That might be a permanent alteration now. So how did you measure when you said 50%? Were you doing leg extensions yeah, step ups or what? Extension. So just the basic, just the basic, again, everybody says the same, how do you know you got 50%? Because I quantified it. So <laughs> I Yeah, sorry, I meant to say like, what movement did you use to quantify it for our listeners? Knee, knee extension. So I just went on a single leg knee extension machine and I worked out what my one RM was on my uh, affected side. So I just picked a weight and just worked up to the point where I couldn't uh, go beyond uh, one RM, and then I did the same thing on the other leg, and realised it was pretty much half the weight of the other side. How often were you assessing? And again, I'm asking now. I'll give you some context. I had a disc bulge, C5-6. So right side, I couldn't do a push. I, I couldn't push left side. Couldn't pull, um, and I got obsessive too about like kind of monitoring it. So how often were you doing it? And, and again, I'm trying to help out maybe any of our listeners out there. Like, all right, fuck, yeah. I've had this happen to too. Be, to be were honest, you doing it every day? Got- yeah, probably not quite every day, but I was monitoring it too much than I should have been. Because yeah. again, you know, there is that constant desire to see where you can see any signs of improvement. Is it changing? Is it changing? <laughs> You're talking <laughs> to my soul, brother. Again, yeah, I, so I was probably doing it three, four times a week when, you know, ideally I'd have said to a patient, we'll assess this once a week or even once a fortnight because we know this, this motor deficits, when they do recover, they recover slowly and they take on average, you know, sometimes six to 12 months to fully yeah. recover, sometimes two years. Yep. So this is what the literature tells us. So, you know, I know that time period is something to have in my mind, but it was very hard for me to accept. So I was trying to see whether I saw changes after two or three days. And then when it didn't, it got me down and depressed. And I was like, oh my God, no, I'm panicking now. It hasn't changed in two days. And I'm like, slam yourself and think, we know and think that's yeah. You wouldn't tell. You wouldn't start telling a patient to be concerned if there's no exactly. change in two days. So why are you worrying about this? There's no change in two days. Yeah. We know better, but we are terrible taking our own advice, right? We, yes, I was. We are our worst fucking clients, oh, mate. Absolutely, we are our worst patients. clients. Terrible yeah. patients ourselves. So that's why I asked if you went into to see anybody that you recommended, just so that way it's like, all right, you don't have to worry about you know telling yourself it because somebody else would tell it to you, right? Like, yeah, no, I get that, and I, and I sometimes say, you know, when a, f- a physician or a therapist has themselves as a patient, they have a fool for a patient. That's a famous <laughs> saying that's often banded around, uh, and 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 I do get that because they can be a bit a bit of complacency, and they things can get missed if you you focus in or you get too concerned on your own signs and symptoms so having an objective third party able to assess you and help you out can be useful but you know I I, I just know that if I went to see somebody um, independently mm. I know 90% of the time I'd have been given some information or some stuff that would have just probably been bullshit and pissed me off and I'd have gone I've just wasted my time and money there anyway so Kira actually posted something similar with his uh the fucking MCL shit or LCL I just saw that post yeah he went to the uh, system and he got a fu- shitty sheet of photocopied exercises for his rehabilitation <laughs> he's and he's like, like the fuck have I just wasted my time and energy for to do this so that's exactly the thought I would have had you know I just there's, a, there's no point in me going 
to see anybody. So I'm just going to keep a watchful eye and monitor it. But what I did have in my mind was that if it doesn't go according to plan or if anything starts to change for the negative or the detriment, then I'm going to go and see somebody. So my approach was is that I'm not being arrogant and thinking I know it all and I can deal with it all on my own. I was going to say, you know, I would seek support or further interventions if things started to deteriorate which they didn't, they plateaued, and then they slowly improved, which is exactly what we should see. So based on that process and prognosis, I just carried on watchful monitoring. I'm wondering, and maybe our listeners out there are wondering the same exact thing, how did you know that it was going to be a disc bulge thing rather than like, oh, maybe some sort of a groin strain? If the pain, it was, I guess it's because it was radicular pain, not... Um, Muscular pain, right? Yeah. Sorry, I answered my own yeah, question. I mean, the mechanism of injury and the signs and symptoms can, can quite reliably, 90-odd percent of the time, give us quite accurate diagnosis without the need for imaging. So there's always this debate around the need for getting an MR scan or some form of imaging to give you the 100% confirmation. And I can understand why some people want to do that, just to get that tick in the box to say, yeah, it's definitely this. But... A lot of the time with these cute episodes, you know, we can we can classify it into this sort of either specific back pain or non-specific back pain. And when we're talking specific back pain, we're talking things like disc herniations or stenosis or nerve root issues. So when we've got, you know, those signs and symptoms and we've got the mechanism and the history in the patient, we don't need to get imaging. So it's, it's listening to what the symptoms are and obviously your objective signs as well. Um. Fernando, it looked like you were going to ask something before I move on. No, no, no. I, was just, I was just reflecting on what I do when I have to train myself and, and it's a very similar process. You know, sometimes I'm like, I know if I go heavy, I can't because I'm strong, but I feel terrible for five days. Nah, I'll be fine. <laughs> I can't walk today. And I just do it over and over again. And I was thinking I have to, um, you know, I'm, I'm the worst patient ever. I mean, but if I, that was, that was going to be my question for Adam, if I had to, I probably have two or three coaches I'd go to and be like, I trust you with the process. Um, who would that be for you, Adam? If you have people, you know. Oh, great. If I had to trust somebody, I think I'd trust my uh, compadre and business partner, Ben Cormack, um, who's a very good therapist when it comes to back pain. So I'd have definitely gone and sought his advice and guidance. Um, my other colleague, Greg Lehman, who's a Canadian physio and chiropractor. I trust him for sound, reasonable, rational judgment. You know, and if I needed medical advice and everything, there's a sports medicine doctor as well called James Noak, Dr. Noak, who, again, I would also perhaps go and see to talk about, you know, the medical side of it, you know, pharmacology, analgesia, injections and stuff along those lines. So, yeah, there's, again, thanks to social media and network of people that I know are rational and reasonable that I would have reached out to if I needed to. Yeah, we don't oh. want to be the uh, doom and gloom podcast. There, there's a couple of good ones out there. There's yeah, of, of course. Ones. Yeah, yeah. And no then, they tend <laughs> yeah, they, they they tend to be say limited, but they are out there. They're not they're not the minor they're not the majority, unfortunately. I want to get your opinion on because I've seen it all too often in sport, and I'm guessing you have too. Where somebody has a back injury, and then all of a sudden you see the fucking people doing like their X band walks, and like they're never moving their spine again. Like, why? in the actual fuck is that what the common narrative is and how can we change it like so again what fernando said there how can we we got an audience of young strength and conditioning coaches out there how can we spin it and get them saying the positive narrative of what we need to be doing out there with a, an expert you know on it well i think there's a number of reasons um one is because of dogma because it's just been said in the past and it just gets repeated time and time again this is the way we've always done it this is the way that we've always seen it work so therefore we're just going to stick with it um the other reason i think is litigation fears as mm, well get people good to, call know, do things that could be dangerous or detrimental and then you getting kicked in the ass financially legally for it as well so i think that's a big driver everybody tends to be overprotective and over guarded uh, because of those fears and concerns and, and then i think the other one is again is just ignorance is just not being fully aware of you know conflicting and contradictory research and information out there i think people only read what they get put in front of them sometimes and that's sometimes only put in front of them by people that have vested interests and biases into one approach over another and so they tend to get very narrow 
view of what the research, the literature and the evidence tells us works. And at the end of the day, when you look at the research and the literature, there isn't much robust evidence that says one thing works superiorly or better than another thing. There's lots of different roads to Rome. Um, and again, it's about having that, that ability to be able to select the right approach, the right road for that person in front of you is sometimes, you know, the skill of a good therapist or coach. You know, I never say, you know, spinal flexion and doing your Jefferson curls is something you would use with every case of everybody with back pain, because that's just as fucking daft as saying <laughs> everybody has to do, you know, bird dogs and keep their spines in neutral with every case of back pain. It's about having the ability to select and choose the type of person who's going to be best served with some Jefferson girls. Or is the type of person with a back injury who's going to be best served with some bird dogs or keeping their spines in a relatively neutral position as they're doing their deadlifts. So it's, it's just having that non-dogmatic, flexible and adaptable approach. Um, but again, I find that's not often done because it's a little bit harder. It takes a bit more cognitive effort. It takes a little bit more thinking. It takes a bit more time. It isn't as simple or as easy as having a protocol, you know, something that you follow mm. and go from step A to step B to step C with every fucker you see. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes it harder to do this, a little bit more flexible and adaptable uh, approach, working in the shades of grey. Nobody likes to do that. Everybody likes blacks, blacks and whites. It makes it so much easier. <clears throat> what about any of our listeners that are hearing this and they're like, okay, cool. What, you know, can you give me some good people Like, you don't need to give uh, names of <clears throat> research that you know, unless you know that well off the top of your head. But if you're like, Hey, you know, go out and find these researchers. So that way you can go to your administration and be able to push for things. And the reason I'm saying it is um, I remember back, you know, like knee pain, everybody was like, Oh, do nothing, do nothing. And then it was like, Ebony Rio and um, Jake Turr and other people had Jill uh, Cook, I think, you know, there's more and more research that people could kind of give to their physios or people at school to be like, hey, look, research shows I can do some shit. Is there people that you'd say, hey, strength coaches listening out there, go find these people? Well, again, it very much depends on what area and what problems you want to talk, look into. But if you're talking something like back pain, you know, to get a alternative approach to the most common narrative out there, you know, we're talking Stu McGill, spinal stability, super stiffness and all that sort of things to reduce risks of back pain. You know, the contrary side of that, the alternative side of that, the research I'd recommend is reading stuff around Peter O'Sullivan. So Peter O'Sullivan did his cognitive functional therapy approach, which is a much more patient centered, individualized approach, looking at not just the biomechanics, but also, you know, the lifestyle factors and things around it. So I definitely recommend, you know, some reading of Peter O'Sullivan's background there for, for back pain, you know, and another really useful paper that I found was some of Michelle Hazenbring's work. And she is a psychologist who worked a lot in people with phobias and she then started to branch into pain and she started to realize that you know there's there's there tends to be two types of approach of strategies of dealing with pain pain avoidance or pain endurance so we're either avoidance copers or endurance copers uh, and i find you know that some of her work has been really useful in helping me clinically reason which type of approach is probably better to take for the person in front of me based on their their strategy that they've adopted for this current situation that they're in so uh, again, pain avoidance and pain endurance coping uh, are two very useful sort of uh, strategies that people have and say Michelle Hazenbring's work has been very uh, good on that. No, those are awesome. I, I wrote those down. I think other people will. Sticking down with what you said, it depends for any of our listeners out there that may be young and they're continuing to learn. What is the simple it monday be, sorry, it should be the old people as well they should also true. be listening true also learning. true you're right i'm sorry what <laughs> would be your that. it's friday right now what would be your hey someone's gonna listen to this and then they go to work on monday what would be that monday morning explanation of the difference between a pars fracture and a a spondy right like let's talk you know we'll stick with the back and then we could talk um a bulge that went you know anterior posterior and lateral and whatnot so the, the, the clinical difference is going to be very minimal, you know, between those two presentations. Um, so you're probably going to struggle to have any strong certainty that you're dealing with one type of 
pathology over the other unless you get some imaging there. But the question I have is do you need to have that imaging to be able to direct your management and treatment? Because they don't really have any specific treatments. Because normally with a spondy or a pars articularis defect, it's normally graded activity and return back into the things they can't do that governs how we manage them. It's not really the pathology. It's their presentations of their pains and their problems. The only thing you've got to be concerned about is, the, you know, is that there could be a other secondary differential diagnosis which might be a little bit more serious and sinister that might need some further interventions, either some surgical interventions. You know? So if you've got something that is unstable or, you know, God forbid, tumorous or cancerous, mimicking any of these conditions, then obviously the sooner that's addressed and rectified, the better. But if you've got none of those sort of gla serious glaring concerns, then does it matter whether you, you're treating somebody with a spondy versus somebody with a pars articularis defect? And the simple answer is 99% of the time, no. Because that isn't what governs how you progress them or regress them. It's their reaction and their symptoms that they have or don't have on the tasks and activities you ask them to do. So that's, that's my, my approach a lot of the time. Now, I don't need a specific diagnosis to help people. You know, I have my suspicions a lot of the time in everybody. That's part of the clinical reasoning process. But it doesn't mean that I, if I'm uncertain, it doesn't mean I can't proceed with helping people. Um, for anybody that has the, in you know, for your own case too, that has the radicular nerve pain, or do you recommend taking you know, prescriptions of gabapentin or things to help with the pain or not? Like, I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm curious on the smile, so. Yeah, no, so my, my personal experience here was quite interesting. So, you know, when I was awake every 45 minutes during the night because of this neuropathic pain and it was really fucking unpleasant, I thought, yeah, I've got, I've got to try and get some sleep. So I want to get something to get this pain under control. So I went and spoke to my doctor and they suggested these neuropathic painkillers and, and I tried them for couple of weeks and they made absolutely fuck all difference. I had minimal positive experiences with any of these neuropathic painkillers. So I didn't get a very good response, but I've heard other people say they were like magic. They, they significantly reduced their pain a lot. Why they didn't work for me, I, I have got no real strong ideas, you know. Maybe it was because of the type of nerve root issue, I think with maybe more the mechanical compressions rather than inflammatory compressions. So if you have you've got a disc prolapse or a part of the disc that's compressing mechanically onto the nerve root, I don't think the neuropathic painkillers are going to be as effective as if you've got some sort of inflammatory irritation to the mm. nerve root. That yeah. may be a reason why, but that's just a guess. Um, but no, I think, you know, when you're trying to get pain under control, again, there are lots of different options for you. Pain can be modulated in some really unusual ways a lot of the time, you know, yeah. and it's not only analgesia and pharmacology that can do that. Movement can be a great painkiller, mm -hmm. you know, massage, manipulations, they can be great painkillers, but that's all you're doing is you're, you're playing around with the symptoms. So I often tell people, you know, it's not about, you know, just trying one, it's sometimes trying a number of them, seeing which one gives you the best bang for your buck with less side effects. So, you know, experiment when you've got these type of symptoms and see what works for you. For me, the one that worked well for me after experimenting a lot of times, hot baths and a glass of red wine. Fucking right. Fucking magic, mate. Absolutely reduced my pain the most. I mean, temporarily wasn't anything lasting long periods of time, but just gave me those two or three hours of significant pain reduction. So if anybody wants my cure for radiculopathy, hot baths and red wine. <laughs> How about traction? Do you, do you use, do you, and again, I know, I'm know i assuming the answer is going to be depends, but traction at the lower yeah, extremity or upper? It does depend, but it has, again, very short lasting effects. And those effects are probably not worth the time, energy and costs of going to get it. So, you know, there are, it's that cost reward ratio. You know, I think, you know, the risk reward ratio as well, but there's also costs, time, energy, effort, etc. And I think a lot of the time with these type of manual therapy traction type treatments, there's a lot of time to get a small lasting effect that just doesn't seem to be worth it for me. And then the last one that I've read research on and have, you know, tried to push for anybody 
is the sensory deprivation float tanks. I like them, have used them. What are your, again, I'm assuming it's going to be depends in case by case, but just want to hear your opinion on it. I've not actually heard of those for pain reduction at all. So that's a new one on me. Yeah, no, the, the place that I go, I'm actually going tomorrow. Um, but the people, uh, the guy had back pain forever and kind of researched it. And then, you know, we were going back and forth. And that's how I was able to get the school to pay for kids t to go. We'd say, oh, they have back pain and throw the guise of getting them in there that way. Interesting. I suppose well, there you go. Hey, I, I I provide like right right there. We're fucking ending the show right here. I was able to provide some content and some uh, some help for him. Um, I want to respect your time. We we've been on here for fifty two minutes. Um, if anybody wants to follow you and continue to learn about you know hot uh, bathtubs, a uh, hot bath and uh, red wine, or any of your other home remedies, where can they follow you? Where can they find you if they don't already know where you are? Because you have a massive following on social media. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a social media whore, so I'm across all the platforms. You can find me on most. I'm even on fucking TikTok. Man. Holy I'm shit, not, look at you. Oh, no. Doing one of these, I'm, like, just dances. And... Yeah, I'm not I'm not in the bikinis and doing the dancing now, quite yet. I, quite are yet. those Cleto Rays behind you? I see the Cleto Ray boxing gloves behind you. They're flies. flies. They're flies, okay. I mean, you, you, you're going to have some TikToks, you just beating people up too, like, you stupid fucking... <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Fuck, fuck. Yeah, no, I'd say uh, I've used TikTok for its uh, social media algorithms and, it, and its uh, technology, actually. I think it's one of the better platforms with all its amazing green screen features and stuff like that. But I hardly use it for any engagement or anything along those. I'm mostly on, um, what's it, Instagram and uh, Twitter. So I'm just under my name, Adam Meekins, or you can look me up under the sports physio as well. Finally, we have Eric Cressy. Eric Cressy is a name that is a staple in the sport of baseball. Eric Cressy started off with his own private facility, uh, originally in Massachusetts, and then another one down in Florida. Then most recently, and when we talked with him, he was the director of health and performance for the New York Yankees. Eric is a fantastic coach who, again, has a wealth of knowledge in the specific domain of baseball. Enjoyed this conversation with him. I work as a strength conditioning coach, uh, both in the private sector and in Major League Baseball. Uh, we have two training facilities, one in Massachusetts, one in Florida. Um, where there's a heavy kind of baseball emphasis, and then I also serve as director of player health and performance for the New York Yankees. Um, in addition to that, I'm you know kind of writer, consultant, speaker. Um, got my hands on a lot of different things. I uh, host my own podcast as well, more kind of in the baseball God. realm. And then I'm a, a husband and a, and a dad of three daughters, so it's, it's things are never dull. Anybody that's listening, like, oh, I don't have any time to do anything. Go ahead and rewind that by 30 seconds and just shut up. Like, re-listen to that, and that's impressive, man. Um, one of the first questions I have for you is, I'll also plug, I mean, Sturdy Shoulders was one of the best things that I got during COVID. Um, it really helped me and my ATs out for any of our quarterbacks. You know, we worked, I worked specifically in football for the longest time, and it was an awesome resource for me. Um, so I've been following you for a while in the private world. What made you decide to actually go into, you know, Major League Baseball? Yeah, I mean, baseball kind of found me. Um, interestingly enough, I was a, a a tennis player growing up and had a bunch of shoulder problems myself. Um, kind of ended my tennis career, to be honest. I mean, I, I worked at a, at a tennis club for eight summers. I strung rackets, gave lessons, you name it. And then sure enough, um, when I decided strength edition was for me and, and I initially went to the private sector, I picked up a lot of odds and ends just on how to take care of my own shoulder. I'd managed to avoid, avoid short, uh, surgery with it. And so when I got to the private sector and you know started working with a few baseball guys, I I really realized that they were an underserved population. Um, you know, we kind of always just got like the, the foo foo rotator cuff band program, or they got like the, hey, just do what the football guys do. And, you know, there was a happy medium where you could push guys hard as long as you were aware of the, you know, the true functional demands of the sport and what unique adaptations they had. So um, just kind of found this little, you know, kind of niche in the industry. And, and over the course of time, we, we carved it out more and more and became much more specialized. Um, you know, so that was at the time high school guys and then, you know, they became college guys, college guys become pro guys, you know, they've got agents, they've got teammates and the referrals, you know, kind of just started coming to, to build us to what we are today where it's, you know, it's not just strength conditioning, it's skill development, there's physical therapy, there's massage therapy, there's all these different uh, layers to it with, you know, I feel like you've like built out analytics slash tech department. Um, and then on, on the you know kind of major league side of things, you know as you know time wore on and um, you know we got more and more results with guys in the private sector and you know had more and more high profile 
players and, and really, you know, a lot of younger players that were getting selected in the amateur draft, you know, and our relationships with major league organizations strengthened. Um, you know, over the years I had kind of several offers, uh, more for consulting roles just because, you know, I don't think very often they look at you as an employee when you have your own gig like that, um, particularly ones that has some momentum on its mm-hmm. side. So um, I actually consulted for the Minnesota Twins um, for 2018 and 2019. Uh, really more in just like a, an opportunity to like test the waters, you know, dip my foot in the shallow end and see what kind of role I would, I would play in professional baseball and if it was a good fit. Um, and so that was a, you know, a compelling opportunity. The Yankees reached out um, at the end of 2019 and um, we were able to work something out where I actually have a much broader role where I oversee nutrition, I oversee strength and conditioning and, and some of the manual therapy initiatives in our organization and really kind of have my hands in a lot of different departments. Um, so this is my fourth, fourth year with the org, and you know there's everything from doing amateur draft stuff. You know, spending I'm, I'm with the team right now at, uh, on a road trip, so um, it's just uh, it's fun because you get to ex- be exposed to a lot of really smart people, lost a lot of across a lot of different departments, and really learn how all the pieces fit together. That's unbelievable. There's so many thoughts that I had with that. Number one, a former athlete of mine who then became a colleague uh, here at Iowa, Mark Weissman. He's now the director of minor league baseball strength and conditioning for the Cubs. So, like, he was – I just heard a podcast that he had, and he was talking about how, you know, that world a little bit works. And it's unbelievable what those guys are doing. And then, like, the – how often do you have to be communicating with them just in terms of, like, if somebody gets called up, somebody gets called down to just be communicating all the time, like, in – how for anybody that's listening like okay how can they take that principle to then apply it into their high performance world because you've got even more moving pieces yeah Yeah. so there there are a couple ways i'll answer that. the first thing is you you mentioned communication and it's paramount like you you have to make sure that you build out a staff of of effective communicators because if you have someone that that doesn't line up with that initiative like scale is impossible and so you know (laughs) if you're in the college setting right you get 30 athletes that come into your weight room you know their schedule throughout the day, you know, their class schedule, their practice schedule, their lifting schedule, all that stuff. Baseball's different, right? So we have, you know, major league, triple A, double A, high, a, low A, then you have your FCL team at your complex. You have a Dominican Academy. Mm-hmm. So you're really, you know, in, in our department, you, you know, you've effectively got dozens of staff members across not just multiple zip codes, but different, like states, different countries. Um, and so there's a lot of moving parts. And that, that's really just speaking to the athletes, right? You also have you know, front office that need to make decisions from afar with respect to roster management and things like that. You have injured athletes who may be going for second opinions with doctors on the other side of the country. Um, you know, you have vendors that you're communicating with as you're, you know, we've, we've actually changed out some of our minor league affiliates. So outfitting weight rooms at different stadiums and doing renovations. Um, there's always a lot of things going on. It's just, that, that's I think what a lot of people don't understand about professional baseball is just how big organizations are where um, you know, you basically have your roster limits domestically of 180 players. So that's effectively your minor league players in the U.S. Then you have your 26-man major league roster. So you're at 206. And then you've got a number of players that are on either the, the 60-day or the full season IL that don't kind of count against those numbers. So that might be, you know, 215 players. And then you have another 90 at your, your Dominican Academy, which you're allowed to have. So before you know it, you're dealing with 300 athletes. So where that leads to is my second point is that it's never just about being smart. Like you can go to every seminar you want, learn every nuanced technique. For me, like where the rubber meets the road on whether I'm effective at my job is how well I teach and how well I, you know, I, I select and mentor good staff that help to, you know, carry out the, the vision that I have for our department and, you know, how will I communicate it. So it's, um, it's really all about scale in professional sports. It's not, it's not okay just to be progressive. Everybody can be progressive if they read another book or go to another seminar. It's all about how do you make it work for a kid that you may have never met that's in the Dominican Republic that we just signed it, you know, at age 17, and we've got to help him get to where he needs to be. So. Yeah, listening to that and hearing not only just how big the roster is, but like you said, you're going to have some scale between that 17-year-old kid and then – I mean, shoot, like, Albert Pujols is in the league. Is he still or used to, like, no, he's, he's, he's commentating now, but he's not but, far. Yeah. Okay, so he, not far, like, that's my point. Is like, you could have a 40-year-old dude in baseball because, you know, it's not as, uh, you don't get, there's no contact. So yeah. there's still difficulties, and I'm not here saying, like, baseball, the schedule, that'll wear on you, first of all. But the fact that you could have a 17-year-old kid and a 44-year-old kid, yeah. like, 
it's a big deal. Because you know, you and I both know youth athletic development. You get an untrained seventeen year old. It's it's not a hard program to write. No, it's actually much more about like reaffirming the importance of consistency, nutrition, sleep, all these different things. But you have to escalate development because there's there's a benefit to getting that kid to the big leagues at twenty one. You know what I mean? That's a that's a really big deal where he's going to deliver a ton of value for the major league roster if you can accelerate his development whereas like if you're talking about a kid that might not play baseball after college like you you have got a little bit more of an on-ramp <clears throat> and you know none of that and like the private sector the game schedules is very very different like a high school kid um you know like we have we have 21 year old players playing major league baseball right now that are playing 162 game season like they're, they're not it's not common that you get somebody that young but like you know you look at like a Juan Soto I think Soto came up before his 20th birthday yeah he was young he was special and you know he's been a very durable player and you know he's been out there and playing very consistently but like you know he was pretty physically mature there there are a lot of like 19 year olds that are still untrained kids that are still getting to know their college strength coach for the first time so you, you always have to hit it on an individual level which becomes extra challenging when you have that many guys so you and i were talking off our listeners you, we were talking off air because my cousin steve ciszek is the reason you know we we connected because steve was one of your athletes um i remember one of the times i was watching steve play in florida or miami at the time and then um waiting for him to leave the, the clubhouse and uh stanton was leaving the locker room at the same time and you want to talk about physically blessed i was like okay that dude I'm like i'm six three played college football weighed 300 now i walk at like 245 and i'm like looking up at this guy like yeah god put him on this earth to go hit baseballs like specimen um but then you also you talked about college baseball and one of the questions that i had was um, I never re- and maybe it was just some of the places that I was at, but I never realized how much college ba- college baseball athletes like they get after it. They're almost one of like they're slanging and banging in there. Yeah. And then Weissman just the other day talked about it, um, and Stevie did too about how like you know once you kind of make it to the pros, it's more about maintaining. And I guess my question is, at what point does the switch flip from like, hey, we got to clang and bang to like, okay, I got to make sure I'm maintaining or whatnot throughout that development for college into professional? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that the big leaguers come in all shapes and sizes, right? And, and baseball is a unique sport because sometimes it's not just raw athleticism that, that gets you there. Um, sometimes it's it's traits, you know, it's characteristics, um, you know, and in some cases, guys are really hypermobile, right? In some cases, they got, you know, a freaky long middle finger that helps them to throw a better cutter or something like that. Um, they're deceptive in their delivery. And yes, the game, don't get me wrong, is trending in the direction of, I mean, it's average fastball velocity has gone up by like 4.6 miles per hour over the last 20 years. Like you don't see as many soft throwing, just locate 87 pitchers in baseball anymore unless they're, you know, absolutely blessed with an amazing changeup and all this stuff. But um, you know, there is a level of athleticism that needs to be present. Um, I'll speak from my experience, and, and let me first preface this by saying that I, I was a competitive powerlifter for a long time. You know, I, I lifted some big boy weights. I have every reason to be emotionally attached to lifting really heavy stuff because I, I did it. And it, it came somewhat naturally to me, and I think we all have our inherent biases early in our career when you program. Um, I, I think you'd be sorely disappointed at what some of the max strength numbers are on a lot of your favorite major league superstars. Um, just because the season is, is so long. Um, I, to be honest, I think the, probably the same thing would happen if you looked at a lot of NFL players. Um, 100%. College to the pros. What's really interesting, um, so I do a lot of work with Proteus. Um, you know, we, we piloted a lot of their equipment. I'm, I'm an investor on the company, full disclosure. And what we looked at is just kind of how force production changes. And we saw some really substantial changes from high school to college players. Clearly, being stronger, more powerful takes you from high school to college. You know, it's, it's a differentiator, right? And that's, you know, a kid learning to hit a ball, you know, 103 off the, off the barrel or something like that. Um, versus when you go from college to pro, there is very, very little change. It, it really comes down to skill development, like how well you recognize pitches, um, how well you locate fastballs, whatever it is. And, and what's actually interesting, there was a good study that literally just came out, it actually maybe pre-publication, that actually shows that force plate characteristics are higher in minor league players than they are in major league players. 
average fastball velocity at one point was was higher in low A than it was in the big leagues. That may have changed. Um, I think you know it may in part be due to the fact that a lot of hard throwers get hurt young and don't actually make it to the big leagues. So there's maybe an an almond natural selection there. But what what it speaks to is this overwhelming characteristic that our job is to build you know a really high performing athlete. And then to some degree, we have to be able to just recognize that we need to get the hell out of the way and we need to not mess them up. Um, and I think particularly in a sport like like baseball, where rotation is king, there are certain athletes that are going to really work, have to struggle to, to preserve their rotation if we load them too much. Um, you know, I, I can think of a lot of really prevalent examples. And the classic example I see is the, the kid that goes to college, right? He's 18 years old. He's moderately trained. He gets there. He puts 150 pounds on his, on his squat, gains 20 pounds. He goes from 88 to 93. He's feeling amazing. And he gets progressively worse in his junior and his senior year doing the same program. Usually what happens is he gets more banged up. The window of adaptation closes. In many cases, he's like a, a wide in for sternal angle guy who just loses his rotational capacity. And those are the guys that honestly we sometimes thrive with, whether it's you know pro ball or the private sector, where we get them away from that. They, they basically get out of a weight room with just a bunch of barbells and squat racks, and they get into a place where they can rotate. We attack medicine ball stuff really aggressive. We, we use the Proteus way more. And you'd be shocked. Like we have, we have pro guys that come back from a season. Um, and, and I saw guys, the 2020 season, that was, was really, really eye-opening for me because we had guys that were highly trained going into it, um, they, they continued to get after it during the pandemic, and then they had a 60-game season. So we had guys that came back from that season that were, you know, trap bar deadlift and 450 for five on their first day of the off season. It was like they had never left. It was the shortest season, and so you're like, all right, now what do we do now that we have a semi-normal off season before the 21 season? So a lot of those guys, we we looked at where they were on this force velocity curve. We trained a ton more speed, strength, absolute speed there. Um, you know, and, and guys took off. Uh, 21 was probably like the biggest velocity improvements that we saw. And I think part of it was that a lot of the velocity numbers were down in 2020 because yeah. of fans in the stands and guys just didn't have that adrenaline. But it was a very big eye opener that like, hey, we don't need to bang our heads against the wall. Getting guys strong is easy. It's figuring out how much strength is enough. <clears throat> and then, you know, once we've, we've filled that bucket, move on and do some other stuff. So I, I think you'd be shocked at how many guys um, in professional baseball can can lift hard for the first month of the off season and then just be athletic the rest you know maybe you just take all that you know max strength thing and one set of four every three weeks and, and you can actually preserve strength really really well and we've certainly seen that with a lot of our um, our measures on more veteran athletes you don't have to beat them up like you do a, a untrained you know 20 year old who's still trying to like get those adaptations in the first place strength sticks around so easily um, I'm, I've been amazed at that in my own training career, but um, I just realized there's there's a lot more that makes athletes successful. So, you know, big big priorities really are are you know basically tickle top speed more often, um, throw the med ball, uh, get really high quality warm ups in, talk to them about recovery, scrutinize their workloads, um, give them great manual therapy, you know whatever it is they need on that front. Look at the nutritional side of things, scrutinize blood work. Like we do a lot of that stuff, and it's it's served us well. Well, because, I mean, like you said, it's got to be the, – the fine art has to be when you can even give them that stimulus and that adaptation within a baseball season, right? Because Steve talked about it, like how hard it is to even train when you're on the road because it's not always the same accommodations. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think Major League Baseball has done a good job of, you know, kind of standardize what's available in, in road weight rooms now. I mean, certainly the minor leagues are a lot different than the Major League weight room. But, yeah, you're never going to get like this – pristine opportunity to do everything that you want when you're on the road and also it's it's tough i think people so let me let me backtrack so i, I have a lot of friends that work in the nba the nfl i mean we have, we have former intern that won the stanley cup last year with the vegas golden knights hey, let's go. I, I talk to these guys like pretty regularly and when i speak to people in different sports my, my own business partner is the massage therapist for the dolphins and when i talk to these guys when someone's a little bit banged up in every other sport you can find a day Right. In the NFL, if you miss a game, you, you basically bought yourself 13 days to, to recover, right? Yeah. You go to the NBA, they don't play nearly as many back-to-backs. NHL, same thing. So, like, if you pull a guy out of the lineup for a night, you can buy them three to four days really, really quickly. In Major League Baseball, it's different. You have a, you have a game that's at, you know, 7.05, and a guy, you know, gets hit by a pitch. You know, it takes 95 off the elbow, and it falls up on it. You might have a 1 o'clock game the next day, and you have to make a decision in that moment, like, is this – you, know, you get an x-ray on it, you see where it's at. And 
you know, the hard part is the rosters are so small in Major League Baseball relative to what you need that you, you have to really take a, a perception on this. Like, all right, do I get a fresh body in here tomorrow and put this guy on the I.L.? Or is it a situation where we can bring him back really, really quickly? So um, baseball is just so different. You, you can't buy time because you, you none of that. You might be like literally flying to the next city right after that game. Yes. Um, so we, we at one point this year, we played 48 games in 51 days. Um, and, and so, you know, historically, you'll have one or two months in the calendar where you might only get two days off. Um, so the Major League Baseball season, it's, you know, I always say it's, it's roughly 200 games in 230 days when you count spring training, um, then what happens during the regular season, and if there's postseason, that's February 12th to October 31. Um, so it's a, it, you know, people call it a grind, and I'm not sure I love that term, but I, I get where it comes from because it is just a, it's a long course, and it's a, it's a, it's a collection of challenges that you really don't see in any other sport. How do you advise them on sleep and nutrition then with all of those barriers they have to deal with yeah i mean it's it's multifactorial like it's it's having great people that do that we have you know awesome dietitians we have awesome performance science department that you know pull sleep schedules for our guys you know there are discussions that go into like when we travel um you know what you whether you fly directly after a game or the next morning like those are always you know questions that come about but yeah we had, we had a point last year we played three games in 30 hours in two different time zones um which is a pretty hard thing to do if you look at a double header and then travel after the game to the next one so um that that probably happens you know, once a year, give or take, where you get like a Saturday rain out, you got to play a double header on a Sunday and then play the next night somewhere else. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge dynamic. And, you know, I think the hard part too, is that schedule was designed many, many years ago when players weren't doing what they do now. Like players did not run as fast, jump as high, throw as hard, swing as hard, you know, 20 years ago as they do now that the, the athleticism and, and you've seen this across all sports where, you know, in the NFL, I've, I've heard people describe it as like a car accident on every play. Um, just people going so fast and running into each other. I've seen like elite tennis up close, like guys hitting balls 140 miles an hour on serves. Like you're, you're guessing in all of them. Um, and the, the raw athle athleticism has just taken these games to crazy levels. Um, and we, you know, unfortunately in a, in a sport like baseball, sometimes that performance is limited by something really small, like a, a tiny little ligament on the inside of your elbow is, you know, what holds the keys to the kingdom with respect to whether you can throw a hundred miles an hour, you know, you know, every other day for an entire season. <clears throat> you talked a lot about, you know, different metrics and speed. So I kind of do want to ask you about baseball analytics. And again, from a super high level, not what you guys, things like that, but is it, has the pendulum swung too far? Because I feel like, again, as an outsider, you know, every money ball was this and then it was, okay, analytics this. And then it was, you know, even in sports tech nowadays in our industry, like how far is too far and um, how do you not get information overload because there are so many choices out there? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a broad question, but necessarily broad, like, because I think you hear the term analytics and some people have like this guttural reaction favorably or unfavorably, you know, to it in the context of the baseball world. And, uh, what, I, what I can say is that the, the data that I have at my fingertips on a daily basis makes me exponentially better at my job than I would be without it. And so for me, the, the net positive is, is way, way, way better. I think where, where we get into trouble with analytics is we become too reliant on it, right? If you, if you look at a player just as a collection of numbers in front of you, yes. and you don't, you don't appreciate how you know, that player might uh, you know, have struggled because of an injury and you just didn't talk to him about it and understood that or an approach change. Like we saw a major league hitter not, not too long ago who had been a guy that just hit the ball to the opposite field a ton. Like had a very, you know, kind of an approach that had worked really, really well for him. This guy, major league all-star, signed with a new team and they basically were like, we want you to hit to the pull side for power. And it, you know, it really changed his swing. It changed the way he looked at everything. It was a, a total difference maker. So the assumption would be like that he'd had a, you know, a dramatic regression in his capabilities or anything like that. And really it was an approach change that, you know, then became kind of like a swing mechanics change. And it, 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 he was a shade of him for himself. So a lot of it was like reverse engineering these guys back to what they were. And that's where the data can be so helpful in, in the strength and conditioning realm is, hey, what were you doing when you were really good? Like, let's go back and let's look at some of that stuff. And what I find myself doing a lot is we have, we have so many outcomes, right? We have exit velocities. Um, yes. You know, we have pitch spin metrics. Spin velocities too, yeah, right? Yeah, you got spin rate, you got spin axis, you've got horizontal and vertical break, you've got extension, you've got horizontal and vertical release height. I mean, obviously you've got velocity. 
you have so many different things, and you, and you have more video than you ever could imagine. Um, you know, we can we can pull video on you know really any player in any game in professional baseball and go and look at it, and that, you know, that's super helpful from a drafting standpoint and all that. And and what you're ultimately using all that information to do is try to try to recreate when they were at their best. We we can scrutinize that better than ever before and you know you know steve's a a, a close friend and we talked about cause steve helped out with you know the falmouth commodores in the cape this summer and oh nice you know, just just talking about it, like him being involved like he's, he's coaching and he's excited about it and wants to stay involved in the game and you know you realize how much easier you know you don't have nearly as much video capability there so it's 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 a lot harder to coach when you don't have this stuff. Like I realized we did it for a long time. <laughs> I, mean, I look back on like what we were doing in like 2010, 2011, whatever it is when these these numbers and technological advancements weren't available to us. Like it kind of keeps me up at night. I think about the guys that really could have helped who, you know, maybe didn't make it to the big leagues that could have if we had been able to teach them a better slider or, you know, figured out why like the you know they kept cutting their four seam or something like that. Now we have you know, a $7,500 camera that can look at this thing in like total slow motion. And it was, it was very cutting edge. I think 2016 world series was the first time that they kind of like rolled it out and fans could see like what it was. And now they're commonplace. Like, you know, guys don't throw a single bullpen without that stuff on them now. So the game has just surged forward so much in the last, you know, seven to eight years. And it's, you know, it's really benefited pitchers way more than hitters. And that's why, you know, batting averages have gone down, and it's 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 much harder to score runs. And so you saw the adjustments to the game with them, you know, taking away the shift and you know bigger bases and reducing the number of you know step offs that pitchers can do to hold runners. They they want to bring athleticism back in the game. They want more contact. Um, so it is a it's a it's a different game now. Pitch clock as well. It's just much more fast moving. Quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out and it helps you be notified when we have new content get released. So again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy this content. And with that, let's get back to the show. <clears throat> Has the pitch clock been something that you, that also kept you up at night? Like, man, how can I make sure these pitchers, their arms are prepared for it for the um, increased density of the work? Yeah, I mean, I, I put a lot of thought into it over the offseason, certainly with our guys, we we tried to simulate it as much as we possibly could, bullpens and things like that. Um, you know what I'll say is I I can count on one hand the number of times I've heard guys complain about it. Um, you know, and I, I talk to a lot of different players from a lot of different organizations. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think we, we, we kind of expected to see this massive sur surge in pitcher injuries. You know, maybe there's some guys that were deconditioned that weren't ready for it. Um, but you know what it was for me? It was, a, I think, a more remarkable la lesson that, that work capacity is incredibly skill specific. I mean, I mean, everything is skill specific, right? You might have amazing balance as a hockey player, but if you went to ballet, you'd be terrible at it. You know, we don't have to your obsession. All right. And, I don't know if you remember when Lance Armstrong start, stopped cycling. Like he, he became a marathoner. He was actually a, a pretty average marathoner. In yeah, it wasn't very good, right? Yeah. yeah like these, these world, you know, class VO2 max tests on uh, on cycling. But um, when he actually started running, there's obviously like different joint. Said principle, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and work capacity is probably the place where it is. So what it speaks to is I don't think going out and just running lots and lots of poles or doing a bunch of like bike sprint intervals was what was going to help them. Just because the actual pitch itself takes you know two seconds to execute, and then it's you know stand around for the next thirteen seconds and deliver one. I think it had to do with just like hey, when you're throwing your bullpens, make sure that you're like executing this in a timely fashion. And that's a that's actually a kind of a challenging thing to push on them in the off season because so many guys are working on stuff. So a lot of times they throw a pitch, they want to hear feedback from the pitching coach, they want to look at you know the iPad that's next to them to see what TrackMan is is showing them. Um, so, you know, you, you have to figure out where it all fits in. But um, I, I can't tell you that we saw a, a giant injury, you know, increase because of the pitch clock. Um, fastball velocity was up in baseball again, you know, just like it has been every year for the last 20 something years. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's altered, you know, pitchers in a lot of ways. I think it's made the game more efficient. And, and like, frankly, like the, the feedback in general across the board was like, oh my gosh, these games go so much faster. It's, it's great. Um, like I had a, during one of our spring training games, while the game was going, I had a meeting with another one of our staff members. We started in the sixth inning, we talked for 30 minutes. 
and the game ended. <laughs> it was like we just played, you know, like three, two and a half, three innings in 30 minutes. It just, it flew by. Um, and I, I never expected that was the case. So it was, a, it was a good eye opener. And, you know, it gets, it gets outfielders off their feet. They're not standing around in uncomfortable cleats for, you know, an extra three hours a week. It, you know, it's definitely shortened it for the better. That's awesome. And that's actually something that Stevie and I did talk about because I had just a theory. I was like, all right, let's work. Let's take basic, you know, strength and conditioning principles. Let's work above the demands. Let's work below the demands. Hey, when you're throwing a bullpen session, like maybe you can't, you have to treat it like a, an outing. Like, Hey, we're going below the demands. You're pitching every 10 seconds. You don't get to see it until at the very end, sit yeah. down, we'll talk about it, then go do it again. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's how I would go about doing it. Like, as an outsider, right? Like, <laughs> we played a um, a, a six forty start last night, and, and we won nine four, I believe it was, and the game ended at nine twenty two. That's awesome. So that, I mean, that's you know thirteen runs and you know two hours and forty minutes for a game. Like it's one of the longer ones. You know, there have been games that have been like right at two hours. Um, but you also think about the trickle down effect. Is like that's a team that can you know, get on the road and, and, and fly, you know, and, and instead of getting in at 4 a.m., maybe they get in at 2 a.m., um, something like that. And then, it's, to be honest, for the fans, it's, it's a family that can get their kids in bed on time. That's um, awesome. You know, it's, it's a really big deal. Like, you know, you got kids that can stay up and watch four innings on a school night instead of, you know, only being able to see the first inning or something like that. So I do think there's, um, you know, there's some benefits. It just pushes out a little bit of the dead time in there. And, and the feedback – you know, honestly, has been pretty good. There were some, you know, people who were struggling with it early on, but I, I feel like they've worked out the kinks pretty well, and it's it's made a better quality product. That's unbelievable. Um, I did not know about the the tennis background, and I kind of then want to talk about: Did you ever? Was your injury? Was it a you know tennis elbow? Was it an, an an elbow injury? And you were like, hey, let's look above below the joint, and that's kind of was the genesis of sturdy shoulders. Um, and if this is something you already covered, please, I no, apologize. And no, I um, it was a shoulder, um, and I had, I, I was a, I was a dying breed. I was a, I was a serving volleyer, um, so I was a much better doubles player, and um, I had kind of this big like externally rotated abducted kick serve that I would kind of hit behind my my head. So I, it required a ton of scapular upper rotation in combination with a lot of shoulder external rotation, just in a vulnerable position. So I was, I was effectively creating a classic internal impingement injury mechanism. And what I wound up with was just a, a chronic undersurface cuff tear, which is what we see. Like in a general population, you see issues on the top side of the rotator cuff, so the bursal side. And in the, the overhead athlete population, you basically get beating up on the underside of the cuff tendons. And as, as you often see with these shoulder issues, um, if it's a partial thickness tear, it, it actually can hurt more than if it's a full thickness tear. You'll see a lot of people with full thickness rotator cuff tears that, that really are asymptomatic. And I'll, I'll finish that part of the story in a second. but. Um, yeah, for me, it was it was a really constant thing. Um, really, I, I played through it like my junior and senior year, never quite got better um, to the point that like I actually was going to college to play soccer instead of tennis because I just didn't want to deal with the shoulder Jeez. stuff anymore. Um, but anyway, long story short, like you know, I wound up not deciding to play college soccer and, and I continue to work at this tennis club. And it got to be, um, you know, kind of the four years later, really, it, it kind of plagued me on and off throughout my, my college career, even when I wasn't super active and, um, you know, on the tennis side of things. So I finished my, uh, my undergraduate career. Um, basically that summer, it was pretty bad. It was keeping me up at night and all this. And Doc scheduled surgery for it. I'd been through bouts of physical therapy that just hadn't gotten better. And, and in hindsight, the reason it didn't get better, like it was more like, here are the exercises, go do them, as opposed to here's how you do them correctly. There wasn't manual therapy. There wasn't a whole lot of counseling on you know, here's how you uh, modify your training to, to work in conjunction with these, um, you know, these rehab exercises. So I, um, I left for my, my grad school start in 2003. Basically, I had shoulder surgery scheduled for my first day after my, my, my first semester. So I was going to take my last exam, drive home, and go to the OR the next morning. And um, so I said, you know what, I, I, and I moved to the University of Connecticut in mid-August mid that year, and I'm like, I'm just going to mess around and try to figure this out on my own. Like, I, I clearly haven't done it, you know, with other people's help, so what have I got to lose? Um, and so I overhauled my training, did things a lot different. I got away from, like, back squatting, went to, like, front squatting, the safety squat bar, did a bunch more, you know, horizontal pulling, you know, pulled back on benching, did more, like, landmine pressing, stuff like that and found a good manual therapist that was right down the street from the University of Connecticut. Kind of, you know, he's a big ART guy when, when ART yeah. was kind of like oh, yeah. new and sexy. And 
Um, sure enough, like shoulders started feeling better and better. You know, it, it went in stages, right? I didn't wake up in the middle of the night with pain and, you know, and then it was, you know, the functional capacity was a lot better. And so I called my surgeon on Halloween and I canceled the surgery. And, you know, that was 2003. It's, it's 2023 and I still haven't had it operated on or, or anything like that. And I'm, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty highly functional with it. I went on, I, I benched over 400 in powerlifting. I can play catch with our guys whenever I need to. But what was really fascinating about this, this is, this is actually the best part of the story. Um, so I, we, our, our staff in Massachusetts would play in like a, a co-ed softball league in the summers. And the end of the season was like an all-day tournament, like where you got your seed and you had to win like four games in order to win it. Um, so it's kind of just like, all right, carve out this, this Saturday and be ready to go out and you know, bring a lot of water and a bag of lunch. And so we went out and played. We went to the championship we lost. And I played third base in four straight games. And what was fascinating about it was like, everything felt good, chucked the ball across the diamond. And after our last game, I went directly to one of our athletes 30th birthday. And adrenaline wore off. I reached down to get a bottle of water and a cooler and I heard a pop in my right shoulder. And it was like, whoa. And it, it hurt pretty good for like a week. And I've had no pain ever since. So I think what I did in that day, I took my partial thickness cuff tear and I turned it into a full thickness cuff tear. I haven't had imaging since. But it hurt for about two weeks, and it's been better. So you, you probably had a buddy that's ruptured an Achilles or a patellar tendon or something like that, and they've dealt with, like, chronic tendinopathy, and then they finally rupture it, and it doesn't hurt at all. It's like, oh, wait, what just happened? But they have zero pain. And, and obviously in those situations, you've got to reattach it because you're not very highly functional when your, your knee or your Achilles is detached. But in a shoulder, you've got, you've got four rotator cuff tends. So if one of them just pops off, you know, it retracts over time, but you have, you know, the ability to kind of work around it. So um, I'm, my hunch is that I now have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. You know, it's two weeks of kind of crankiness, you know, it's, I don't know, six years ago. And it's been good to go right now. I, I play catch most days of the week with somebody. I, I demonstrate exercises all the time. I, you know, I, I lift four days a week and it's, it's no problem. Do you have to change how you throw or what? Uh, I, let's just say I never had really what you would consider an elite arm action. I kind of throw strength coach cutters anyway, but no, I mean, in my long tossing, you know, 300 feet or throwing off the mound, no, but I'm often I'm playing catch with guys during like return to throwing programs or something like that. So it's, you know, I played catch with Steve a couple of times on a, on a, on a weekend when he needs to get a throwing session in and the family's traveled or something like that. But yeah, I, am I pushing it? No, but my hunch is that you would actually probably see a lot of shoulders that are way uglier than mine. Um, if you looked at some of the really veteran major leaguers that have thrown for a long time, typically what you see in old throwers is they, the cuff chronically fails over the course of time and um, they, they're able to manage it. So that's why you, you see a lot of crazy things on MRIs that aren't necessarily clinically significant. Now, when you have guys that are rec recovering from things, are you then trying to change the arm slot action or are you like, hey, let's just reestablish what they had or how do you go about that? Um, it depends. Um, you got to remember, there's always a drift. Right, you you have these these outcomes where all right, say vertical release height, right? If you get a guy to you know hinge a little harder, sit into his back hip, his vertical release height is going to come down, right? If you get a guy more up tempo, get moving down the mound with your delivery, your vertical release height is going to come up, right? Um, you know, and there's going to be similar changes that take place in you know extension, all these different metrics. And what you're going to find is like these major league players, like every pitch is not the same. Like things just deviate here and there. So you'll see guys that drift, their vertical release height might come up 0.2, go down 0.2 over the course of a season. So there's, there's actually way more variance than the, the casual fan probably appreciates. Um, so when you talk about like changing arm slot, like there are times when you'll do that. My rule of thumb is you always want to coach upstream, you know, looking what people are doing early in their delivery. S same with the, you know, like, you know, swings and hitters is, you know, what does the hip load do? I think we see way too many people that, that try to change arm action when in reality, sometimes the arm action is bad because the direction from the back hip is like that. So a classic example is a guy who gets really like inverted elbow climbs a lot. Often that's a kid who, who has like kind of a drift in his center of mass towards third base as a right-handed pitcher, where if you, you actually teach him to be a little bit more linear to the plate, the arm has more time to actually get into a good position. So I'm never a big advocate of changing arm actions. Uh, most of that, in, in my opinion, is very, uh, it's very ingrained by the time we get high level athletes. You know, maybe you change it with a, you know, a nine year old that's learned how to play catch. You know, how do you take the ball out of the glove? How do you even hold a four seam? Um, but I think later on your, your solutions are, you know, are more look at the lower half and see what direction is being created from it.
how often is it the front hip versus the back hip? Like they don't want to land on the front leg versus they're not pushing off the back leg. So it's, it's a, it's a bit of an inverse relationship. Um, so there's the, the more you're in the back hip, generally, in other words, the slower you are down the mound, the more aggressive you can be with that lead leg block. Conversely, if you're a guy that gets really aggressive, you get down the mound fast, you're generally going to be softer on that front leg. And there, there are major leaguers who are successful in both ways because big leagues is all about just, you know, being unique, being deceptive, getting guys out and all that. So there's, you know, there's no one way to do it. The research is a little bit suggestive of the fact that if you're a little softer on the front leg and you get down the mound a little bit more, you're not going to throw as hard, or as hard, but you generally tend to be a little bit healthier. Um, conversely, if you tend to be a little bit more of like just get that front foot down and go, you know, that lead leg blocking creates more velocity. Um, so you just got to find the, the, the delivery that works best for you and what works with your pitch profile and all that because it's been done – you know, different ways. Justin Verlander is a very aggressive lead leg block. He's a guy who's, you know, pitched up to 101 in his career. You know, Corey Kluber is a guy who gets way down the mound and has a little bit more of a softer front side. But, you know, he's won two Cy Youngs with, like, pinpoint command, throwing in lanes, you know, without having to pitch it, you know, 98 to 100. So different strokes for different folks. My God. And, again, from a 10,000-foot view, how different are their – how do you train them in the weight room differently? Do you need to account for that? How does that work? Yeah, it's actually funny you say this because I had this conversation with, with a big leaguer yesterday. Is um, you know, I, I think you always try to create context. Here, here's how this exercise allows you to get to this position in your delivery, some of that stuff. Um, you know, but I think, you know, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, you know, I would say there are different ways of batching athletes. You, know, you have guys who are wide infrasternal angles, narrow infrasternal angles. You have guys that are hypermobile. You have guys that are tight. You have guys that are you know, left and right-handed even create some complexities. You know, you're not going to see a lot of right-handed guys with low left shoulders, right? You'll occasionally see maybe a left-handed guy with a low left shoulder. You'll see a ton of right right shoulders that are really low in any major league locker room. Um, there's just a normal asymmetry, and certain guys, you know, re reaffirm it more if you're familiar with some of the posture restoration principles and all that. So um, we have a lot of different ways to batch guys. And I think, you know, some of, like, our, our force velocity characteristics, whether it's on force plates, proteus, that can tell us a lot more as well about whether athletes are, you know, are they very, very elastic. Some of these like fascially driven athletes tend to be at your narrow infrasternal angles. Those are the guys like you, you, you have them squat 400, they smoke it, you give them 405, they get buried, right? They don't have the ability to grind. They're just very elastic. Uh, and then conversely, you have these wide guys, you know, they tend to be very hingy. They want, they need to work linearly and just optimize, you know, rotational capacity. Those guys, give them lots and lots of loading they get good for a while and then eventually it starts to work against them so you have to work harder to you know basically uh preserve their rotational capacity so you know ultimately it, it, it's something different for everybody um and it, it changes over the course of a training career particularly as you know as they age and you know accumulate more wear and tear you got to be a little bit smarter about it but um yeah it's a it's a it's a great question it's a hard one to answer succinctly unfortunately it's all good um another question that i had about the baseball world and again, coming as a mainly football guy that's worked with a lot of different other athletes, but my quarterbacks, we would, I gave them tons, and kickers, punters too, tons of leeway in the weight room. Like, hey, if based on your training age, if the rest of the team was doing a barbell snatch or a dumbbell snatch or a barbell jerk, dumbbell jerk, we they had the choice to either do it, do the barbell or the dumbbell, the opposite of whatever they wanted, or we would do some sort of jump. Um, I feel like the word snatch or jerk or over, like we didn't even do a limp, we didn't do cleans with the football team there, and that's a whole nother side conversation. But snatches, jerks, anything overhead or benching, those seem like kind of cardinal sins in baseball. And again, my outsider's brain was like, hey, if they're going to live overhead, let's get them strong overhead. Here's a decent way to do it. Um, Yay, nay! Like, would somebody just look at me like you're, a re you're like you're crazy for even trying to do that? Yeah, I um, I would say it's uh, it's a hard question to answer, and and the first reason is one is if that's a 16 year old kid that's playing three sports, I don't really have an issue with it, right? These are these are movement competencies that you want them to learn, all that stuff. The game obviously gets more specialized as time goes on, right? So, um, I think I think the question you have to ask yourself is, does the benefits conferred from this exercise 
outweigh the potential downside of it? And, and can I get the same favorable training effect from this um, in, a, in a less risky manner? So I'll, I'll give the example. We use, we use landmine split jerks with guys all the time, right? Landmine press is kind of like a pseudo overhead press. If you look at the angle of the bar, like it'll blow your mind how many people that can overhead press and can't bench press can go in landmine press. But like, in, I'll, sorry to interrupt you, but from your talk, like yeah. you've specifically taught them to do it kind of like that you yeah. and to really lean and press into it to get that scapular movement. So yeah. kudos to you on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a, 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 of a difference. I, I think it has a lot to, I mean, here's the benefits of overhead pressing, right? Is that scapula can move as free as it wants, right? The challenge with, with a true overhead press, whether you're doing like a, you know, a dumbbell jerk or barbell jerk or whatever, is like you gotta go directly against gravity. Like it is, it is 100% straight up and down. So you're gonna have way more recruitment of the shoulder flexors. You're just gonna to have to compete directly against that. Landmine press obviously gets you at probably like this, you know, this 45 degree angle. So the question then becomes like, why not just do an incline press? The challenge with an incline press is your scaps are- Scaps can't move. They're, fi okay. they're fixed to a bench, right? So first off, they can't move. In fact, we're coaching them, you know, to not move. But the other thing I'll tell you, and Mike Robertson actually just put a really good video up on this, is like anytime you get back on a bench with weight downward, what using like a barbell bench as an example, like think about what you're doing is you're compressing the rib cage front to back, right? Yeah. So that might be perfectly fine if you have like a narrow infrasternal angle guy, maybe one of those like really fashionably driven six foot three, 175 five pound athletes where you just desperately got to put 20 pounds on them. <laughs> if you get your like guy who's 220 already put together, you compress him. Go check his rotation after that set. And, and don't just check like shoulder and turn rotation or something like that. Go check thoracic rotation, even look at his hips. You'll, you'll actually see that when you compress them like that, there is, a, there is a price to be paid. So I always come back to like, hey, can they do this exercise and leave the gym today with as good or even better motion than they walked in? Because rotation is king in a, in a, in a baseball population. Um, like you take that away and they're going to go somewhere else to find it. So um, I think all too often, like, ah, oh, you know, this is nothing. It's a small percentage of their training volume. But like I, I did my master's thesis on unstable surface training. And we found that even 2 to 3% of training volume on unstable surface training, like attenuated changes in, in, in power outputs and, and strength measures, like... That's a big deal. So, you know, your body is constantly adapting to whatever stressor you throw at it. Um, so I think it's important for us just to be like mindful of like, what is the exercise selection that doesn't just deliver a favorable outcome. Hey, scapular upward rotation, upper extremity hypertrophy, whatever it is, but also minimizes, you know, the, the potential risk that they may be encountering. No, that's, as you were talking about that, the thing that I thought of instantly was another guy, Boyle, who is in the private sector world went in Major League Baseball, um, one of his talks, though, was about like, okay, if you're always doing rotation, how much of it in the weight room needs to be more rotation versus anti-rotation? How do you handle that complexity for any of our listeners who do work in the baseball world? Yeah, so here, here's something I'll tell you is um, everybody responds, <clears throat> excuse me, to the, th the stress of throwing slash swinging differently, right? So we have guys that throw a baseball and lose shoulder external rotation. We have guys who lose a, throw a baseball and lose shoulder internal rotation. I think the problem is a lot of those studies, they look at averages and they should be looking at standard deviations and outliers uh. where you see these guys. So uh, case in point, Mike Reinold was a, um, a co-author on a study in 2009 that looked at um, range of motion changes after pitching in professional pitchers. And so they basically showed there was a, you know, an average loss of internal rotation and elbow extension all well and good, right? Not, nothing you would be surprised at when you look at this large sample size. What was interesting was how big the standard deviation was. It was like 190, 191 degrees of total motion. So internal plus external rotation yeah. in that shoulder. And then you had, you had guys that were probably in the 160s and you had guys that were probably up in the 230s. So you had these hypermobile guys that they weren't losing any motion. They were becoming more unstable after long <laughs> throwing. Those are the guys that you're worried about subluxing or tearing ligaments. And you had guys that would lose a lot of motion, not just like internal rotation. They could be losing ER. Um, they could be using, losing shoulder flexion. Um, so it's just one of those things where you do all these things. You throw a baseball at a high level. There's a ton of shoulder, external, and internal rotation, but guys still lose it. Um, so like to the comment on these guys are rotating all the time, you know, do we really need to do it? Like, I think we need to do something to make sure that it sticks around. Um, I think we need to consider, can we train it at a different point on that force velocity curve? Um, and true, can we, tr can we train it in the opposite direction, right? If they're, if they're right-handed hitters, like you got to left rotate a little bit. Right. Um, you know, yeah. that's, 
that's really, really important. And, uh, you know, I think looking back, you know, I wish I had known what I know now about, you know, different people will respond based on their compression strategy. So if, you know, if our listeners haven't filled, you know, checked out some of Bill Hartman's um, work, I think it's, it's really, really useful. Narrow versus wide ISAs, like they will lose motion somewhat predictably based on what their, their skeletal archetype is. Um, Rick Franz at the university of, or Clemson has, has done yeah. a great job with this. Well, he's an awesome podcast for me talking about it and it impacts the way that they move. So I, I, I generally never am, am um, like steadfast reductionist, like this athlete shouldn't do this. I'm way more, I guess I'm methodology agnostic. Like I, I look at it and say, here's the athlete that's in front of me. Here's what I see on them. And, and these are the best courses of action. Not like, I love this drill. Let's go use it with everybody. Um, again, hearing you say all of this and being an outsider, I'm thinking, okay, baseball, you could almost be very much like a track and field thrower, bonder chuck, um, because I feel like from any of as strength coaches hearing, okay, um, uh, a slightly heavier implement versus a slightly lighter implement, like you see that in the world of baseball and, and golf more, correct? Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you guys about our sponsor, Team Builder. If you have any online training platform needs, Team Builder is the go-to place. Team Builder has the ability to integrate with velocity-based training tools. They have the ability to program and have notes and videos for all of your athletes and your clients. This is your number one stop shop. Been using it since 2019 when I was working at Towson. So I've used it, love it. Make sure you check it out. Go ahead, click the link down in the description. And with that, let's get back to the show. Yes. Um, so the first thing I'll say is I, I think the, um, the aggressive look to like javelin throwers to really help baseball players is, is a really tricky one to make. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I think we can learn a lot from every sport. And I'm I didn't, gonna, sorry, I didn't mean to think that, but like, Hey, we're going to throw a heavier implement and a lighter yeah, implement. Like, yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. I, I think the nature of a five ounce baseball is such that you can get to more extreme range of motions. Right. And so as a result, it's probably leaves a, an elbow more vulnerable. We know you don't lay an arm Ooh, nearly yeah. as much when you're throwing a heavier implement. Um, and, and so looking at like a, a quarterback, right. A football is obviously heavier than a baseball. And you very rarely see UCL tears in football players. You know, you, you get a couple here and there, but it's usually like kind of collision related. Somebody grabs an arm as you lay it back or a fall on an outstretched arm kind of contributes to it. And, and, and more often than not, they can be managed, you know, uh, conservatively over the course of a, of a career pretty well. So, um, you know, I do think there's something to be said for that. Um, but weighted balls are, are definitely hot topics in the baseball community. You know, they do seem to, I mean, the evidence suggests that they increase injury risks, but they also increase oh. velocity. And we also have to figure out, like, is, is every weighted ball program created the same, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. the people who are drawn to using weighted balls are the people that are just drawn to trying anything and doing aggressive throwing programs. And kind of like the, the result of any one-size-fits-all program is 25% of guys get hurt, 25% of guys get worse, you know, 25% of guys maybe get a little bit better, and 25% of guys stay the same, you know? So it's just... It, you got to look at where you kind of fit on, on that bell curve. Um, but, you know, we use weighted balls. You know, oh, it's just okay. a matter of how do you use them, you know, how, what the volume is, what the intensity, what time of day are you using them. Like we have some guys that make like three throws with like a two-pounder against the wall just to kind of get loose. They may do some reverse throws. And so not all drills are created equal. Um, so I think, we, I think we need to just, again, take a step back and not just vilify the implement. I think we need to think about like how is it actually used and and that's where you realize you can borrow from those other populations but, but make no mistake about it like javelin throwers have plenty of throwing related injuries there just aren't as many javelin throwers so you don't hear about them nearly as much but they blow out ligaments all the time the first tommy john i ever saw was a javelin thrower their shoulders are messy their their lead legs are you know their knees are not in great shape um you know, i've seen enough javelin guys over the years to realize that their injury histories are probably even more speckled than the baseball players i see I had a girl at Towson who, as a freshman, um, tore lead leg ACL, landed dislocated elbow, right? Like, so, yeah. Like, but I did study some of the baseball population stuff on, you know, you know, working that elbow because it didn't have to get repaired, but 100%. Um, you talked about it with throwing backwards, and I do remember hearing it either from your stuff or a different baseball person back in the day. Do you still do or did you ever do or does it hold water like throwing Frisbees to get the high velocity on the opposite direction or no? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a necessarily a training. Like just to warm up, maybe, or is it just uh, like? 
it's it's more of like, hey guys, like you're you're tired of doing really regimented sprint work, like go out and throw the frisbee on the turf, like Got it. yeah, athletic, have some fun. I mean, heck, I, I like to do that myself. So yeah, it has. Uh, I don't think it has a, a crazy amount of, of training, you know, validity to it, just because most guys don't throw the frisbee with like full blown rotation. It usually tends to be like more athletic <laughs> or anything like that. So yeah, I would I wouldn't view it as like a a really like you know bold training initiative. Okay. Uh, I only got two more questions that I'll, uh, you know, respect your time, but, um, you know, you're a hundred percent in a, like you said, very high position with lots of different people that, you know, working together in communication. How do you hire? Like, what are kind of some of your just big rocks for our, um, directors and, um, high performance managers that are members and listeners out there? Yeah. I mean, I, the one thing I, I'll say this, and I don't want it to sound disparaging. Like I know you have a lot of young coaches that, that listen to this. Is unfortunately a lot of young strength and conditioning resumes are they're very homogenous. And what what I mean by that is they look very much the same, right? Most of them have an exercise science degree. They usually come with a, a letter recommendation from an academic department chair. Um, they usually list how they, their cover letter is all about how passionate they are, how they were a former athlete, and how they love this. Um, you know, then there's usually like a, a resume that shows, you know, they, they scooped ice cream in, in high school at some place and then they, they were a personal trainer at like their local YMCA and maybe there's an internship supervisor that wrote them a letter or something like that. The, the letter, they generally tend to always fall in that realm. Um, and I, I think what you want is, is you want to see people who have gone above and beyond, like people who have a gone out and sought out you know, higher level education, things that weren't easy to get to, right? Anybody can do just like stuff in their hometown. It's a big deal, like move across the country for an internship or like volunteer your time, drive a couple hours to, uh, you know, when you see like college kids that have like spent money out of their own pocket to go to seminars and check these different things out, like that, that speaks volumes um, for me in a lot of ways. So I, I always look for like ways that they can demonstrate that A, they have a big growth mindset and that, you know, this is someone that is going to be just curious and, you know, we're going to be able to invest in them and they're going to soak it up. But just as importantly, as they soak it up, they're going to start to see relationships. They're going to start to see ways where they can use it and, and make us collectively better because we want them to, to spread their wings and be successful. So that's really, really helpful. Um, and then I think, you know, obviously like a, a, a demonstrated ability to find value where other people's miss it. And I've told this story before, but we had a, a, a kid, um, he played club baseball at Northwestern and, um, you know, he's contemplating whether he's going to like try out for the actual team or anything like wonderful, wonderful kid and trained with us for a summer in Massachusetts. And, you know, as time went on, he's like, you know, I really would love to get a, a baseball operations internship with like a major league organization. He's, you know, he's studying economics, like really bright kid. And he's like, would you mind looking at my resume? And this is I don't know, seven or eight years ago. I'm like, sure, you know, bring it in. And he lists it all off. You know, it's like all his coursework and everything. And the last thing down at the bottom, he's like, uh, under like jobs, he's like, I, I made $40,000 in a summer buying and selling things on eBay. I was like, dude, put that at the top. Like that is the very definition of finding value where other people miss. Like he's like 12 and literally just like you know, buying widgets on, on, on eBay and then selling them for $40 more than he bought them for an hour later. Like he was just really, really good at it. And I'm like, that's what people are looking for. It makes you unique. It differentiates you. Um, so I think those are great. I don't think you can ever go wrong with like, letters of endorsement or listing as a reference clients slash athletes that you work with um i think those things are are always really really compelling for me taught me about you know someone whose life you changed who, who really you know swears by you and you know somebody you stay in touch with those things are are really really um good things and then obviously you want you want someone that's going to be a great you know teammate someone who's gonna um you know fit in with what you have in place and um so you know you listen for a lot of those things where you know my, my kind of walking away from a, an interview, I, I hate to say this, like it's either a hell yes or a hell no. Um, and I don't mean that in, like a, in a bad way, in the sense that like I write people off right away or automatically say, yes, you're on to the next round of interviews or whatever it is. It's more like, is this what this person really wants to do? Um, and I remember uh, Mike Gambino is a, a good friend. Mike was the baseball coach at Boston College and he just, he just went on to Penn State um, and they had a great year at BC and he did an amazing job of building up that program. But when he first got to Boston College, I remember him saying to me, he's like, we don't want guys that just come here because they can't go to the University of Virginia. We want guys that want to be at Boston College. And that line has always stuck with me. Like, I want people that want to be with us, not just like, hey, I put eight resumes in and I have to do this internship because, 
you know, I have an academic requirement. Like, I want to know why you want to be here. And if you can, you know, clearly illustrate that in an interview, you know, or in a cover letter, I, I think that goes a really long way. Amen. And then venturing into the world of private stuff and get 